you know, what I would like to say <laughs> is this. It goes back to what I said about the way that I'm trying really hard to get people to understand it is it's just like salsa. Mm -hmm. Salsa has on one, on two, Cuban, right, cumbia, um, Colombian. They are all different styles. We have to be able to figure out a way to respect each other in our styles without making people feel bad for liking one or the other. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I Need feel judgmental. like I feel like there is this weird thing where people in the urban kids community think that everyone in the Kizoma community don't like them. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. People in the Kizomba community feel like people in the urban kids community don't like them, mm -hmm. right? And so when you have that kind of um, animosity, right? It's it's not even animosity, yeah. but it's that like you know I have a saying that is this: perception can be reality. Yeah. It doesn't mean it is reality, but it's reality for that person that's perceiving it, right? right? So sometimes I come across. Um, you know, people call me a traditionalist or like, you know, oh, this is all your mindset. It is because I love the Angolan culture. I love the Angolan music. I really fell in love with Kizomba and Semba. I personally don't feel connected to Urban Kiss, mm -hmm. right? You and yeah. I have had this conversation. It's not that I think Urban Kiss is bad. Personally, I wish it had a different name. Uh -huh. I know that that's part of the like angst in part of the Kizoma community, but Urban Kiz is not going anywhere. Right, Urban right, Kiz right. is here, just like Sensual Bachata is not going anywhere. Right, right, when right. you talk to somebody who's Dominican and you say Sensual Bachata, you know, there's like a thing, yeah. right? And it's because it's a cultural thing. But for some reason, these dances, you know, Kizomba means party, right? Right. It means party in Kumundu, which is a native language to Angola, mm -hmm. right? At a party, you don't go to a party to be divisive, right? 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 You're inclusive, you right, don't go to a party for you not to come together and have conversations. Right. You go to a party, and families might fight but then you get together and you have a drink about it, right? Mm -hmm. In the same party. You go to a party and, you know, some people are cooking and eating over there and some people are drinking and some people are doing this and everybody's dancing and you can go and mix and talk right, to right, everybody's right. there. It's a house party for right, crying right. out loud. That's what a party is, right? Kizomba is supposed to represent that, right? And this is what I mean by understanding the culture to be able to understand the dance. Mm -hmm. So... When you are like, oh, well, I don't like this person because this person does it this way, or I don't like this person, y'all need to stop, uh -huh. right? I, I like chocolate ice cream. You can like vanilla. It's okay. Right, right, yeah, of course, <laughs> right? of course. We can still hang out. Yeah. And if there's a Napoleon, I get to eat your chocolate, and you get to eat my vanilla, right, right, and right. we can share and have a good time, Yeah. right? I feel like the divisiveness and the perception of this divisiveness has created animosity and that grows animosity between the students mm -hmm. because yeah. it starts from the top it's down, definitely. right? If I don't like somebody and I talk negatively about somebody, my students hear me say that, yeah. therefore I'm not going to like that person either. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. There are lots of people that we don't like or we don't get along with or we're not besties. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I actually don't like you or don't respect you. Mm -hmm. Just because we're not besties doesn't mean I can't have a mutual respect for your art, for your yeah. for your practice, for your dedication. Like urban kids is not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. That takes time. That takes years. Of that course. takes technique. That takes every musicality that takes stuff that does to create what they've created, right? So I, you know, I live in this happy place where I want people to be kisomba. I want people to have a party and I want people to get along. Mm -hmm. um, what I want people to understand is that the negativity within the communities themselves mm -hmm. 
is what splits the community. Yeah. Which makes it actually, it, it pulls people away from what you are trying to share. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Oh, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, definitely. Right? Uh -huh. So I, I want very much for people to understand that just because someone doesn't have a passion for it doesn't mean that they have a disrespect for it. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. Like yeah. I, I don't want to teach tango. I love tango. It's beautiful, but I don't have a passion to teach mm -hmm. it. I can respect urban kids without not having a passion for myself personally dancing. Right, right, right. I understand that. You know, if I look at it like another genre of dance, then it's another genre of exactly dance. Exactly right. It right. is. It is a completely separate dance, correct? Right. It's exactly. Just, I guess unfortunately, it might have a very similar name to some. That's else. the pro. That it, it comes down to the name, mm -hmm. and and I say that because, for example, when Kizomba was first created, uh, the Kizomba dancers used to call it Sembazuk. Okay, I didn't know that. So Sem Kizomba comes from Semba, exactly right? Right, right, right. But it was Semba music mixed with Zouk music right. that created that Munu sound. And the dancers didn't know what to call it, so they were calling it Semba Zouk. The Semba dancers, the Semba musicians, the Semba artists were all like, this is not Semba, what are you doing? You can't call it Semba. Should we, should Gee, does that it? argument not sound familiar? It does. Right? Yeah. So then Eduardo Paim's bandmate was like, oh, they're like, oh, they were in an interview and they were like, well, what is this new sound? What is this new thing? And he's like, it's Kizomba. Uh -huh. Because it was the party, the name of the parties that they went to. Mm. So that's how it got the name. Okay. So Kizomba is not Semba. Kizomba comes from Semba. Exactly. Right? But there's different techniques. There's different ways that you dance it. You dance Kizomba differently than Kizomba. Sometimes it's very similar. Sometimes it's completely different. Right. To me, I look at urban kids or French style Kizomba, Kizomba 2.0, two urban kids, the same way that Semba dancers would look at the Kizomba dancers that used to call it Semba Zuka. Mm -hmm. I understand that. It, to me, it's the same fight. Mm -hmm. It's just a different generation, right? right? right Every right. generation. I feel like this might be an ongoing problem then. Well, way. it kind of is, right? Like, think it's about Brazilian Zook and Zook. Yeah. Right? And, you know, um, Pechu is like, you know, the kids always do something that the parents don't do. Right. They always take what the parents did and then you change it. Change. He changed it with Kizomba and then the other generation behind them will change it. They will change it. Yeah. It's how you go from son, dance son, mambo, cha-cha, right. salsa on one, salsa on two, rueda, <laughs> right? Everybody does their own thing. Right. It's, it's just about understanding the respect of it. Mm. So, in other words, stop the fighting. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I hey. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to today's episode of the Two Podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Greer. Joined today by a wonderful and spectacular guest, Miss Kianda. Hi. Hey, hey. So, um, <laughs> I guess a little background. I started taking private Kizuma classes with you around 2016, 2017. Yeah. You were one of the few people who were teaching Kizuma by that time in uh, the Virginia area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I started taking classes with you. I immediately fell in love with the dance. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, know, you are a mambo, salsa, kizumba, simba, tadashinya performer, dancer, as well as instructor. Uh -huh. uh, you are also the co-owner of mm -hmm. uh, Mambo Room Cultural Dance Center. Is yeah. that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's Mambo Room Cultural Event Center. Oh, excuse me, but my yeah. last. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, you were born in New Jersey, currently living in Norfolk, Virginia. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to these things. I understand. No worries. But yeah, I'm doing good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I kind of want to, you know, I kind of want to start this out, you know, uh, I'm very curious to hear about your childhood in New Jersey. What was that like growing up in New Jersey? So I'm a military brat. Okay. So technically, um, some of my friends always, they call me Japanese. Okay. <laughs> because, because I was born in Japan. Mm, so I, didn't I was know that. born, yeah, I was born in Yokosuka, Japan, because my dad was in the Navy. And then um, my dad finished off his tour in the Navy, did ROTC, then went Army. Oh. So I also lived in Germany. 
and then I saw that. Okay. Yeah. yeah and then um, my dad retired in New Jersey, so I always claim New Jersey as my home because I was. I think we moved there when I was like 11, ah. and then I stayed there until after college. What else? So, so how long did you live in Japan then? Um, only two years. Okay. So I was a baby when we left. So mm. I actually haven't been back yet. Ah. I want to go back, so cool. and I keep trying to make trips to go back. Mm -hmm. And then I got really sidetracked by Kizomba because yeah. I was supposed to go and teach um, dance. I was going to teach salsa. And then I fell in love with Kizomba and stopped trying to go to Japan and ended up in Portugal. Okay. And then last year ended up in Angola. And mm. so I still want to make it to Japan, Dang. but I've had other places. Yeah. Are you busy? <laughs> that, that like sidetracked yeah. me. Yeah. So, so, so you go from Japan to Germany, is that right? We went from Japan to the United States oh. to my dad actually was at Fort Lee at one time. Okay. Which is where Terrence is at now, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Yorktown? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Massachusetts, and then we were in New Jer oh. uh, Virginia, and then we went to Germany, and then back. Okay, so you definitely a music kid. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then um, after we went from Germany, we went back to Virginia, then Massachusetts, and then New Jersey. Okay. So no. yeah. I'm, very, I'm very curious to hear, um, you know, I guess, how important was music in your childhood? So we had this conversation earlier. I was that child that the monkey leashes were invented for. <laughs> so, no, yeah, yeah. so I still have a hard time. Like if there's music playing, uh -huh. I will move and I won't. You won't even know. So like a little like, bit ADD, or she? What do you mean? I'm sure if ADD was a thing okay. back when I was in school, <laughs> I would have been diagnosed as ADD. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel like I have ADD. Okay. I just feel like music is like a so thing. It's like it's inside my blood, and mm. it just when it's when I'm hearing it, I'm moving all the time. Okay, and yeah. when I'm not hearing it, if I'm not actually having a conversation with somebody, it's in my brain, and mm. I can hear it in my and my and I just constantly am moving to music. Okay. Um, without it, I'm kind of quiet and shy. Actually, oh. I'm very much of an introvert. That's, I hear this a lot from instructors. They're, they're introverts <laughs> oh, somehow. <true. laughs> I'm such an introvert. I'm shy. I'm like really awkward when there's um, a group of people at a okay, party. Yeah. I'm not the one to be like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that'll hang out on the wall. And I know sometimes people are like, oh, are you, you know, they, because they'll see me in front of a class or when music's happening, I'm dancing. Like when music happens and I don't care right. who's there. I'm like, do you want to dance? Do you yeah. want, they don't care. Do you know how to dance? I don't care. Let's go dance. Um, but it's because I love to dance and mm. I love the music. And so, um, I was always, if I'd hear music, I would follow it and I would end up at a neighbor's house. <laughs> when I was like two, you know, like I, my earliest memories are my mom trying to clean the house while I'm like trying to dance with her okay. because we put music on to clean the house. With. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's what got me to dust. Okay. Music, sure dusting, no problem. Ah. Vacuuming, music, no problem. Hey. No music, I was not no interested. Motivation. <laughs> it was no motivation. Okay, I get you, I get you. Yeah. So, so tell me this then, I guess, you know, Growing up and everything, um, what were some of your hobbies then? As, you know? Dancing. Dancing, okay. So um, I've always been a dancer. I got kicked out of ballet. Because of what? Please tell me this. Okay, so it, it goes back to I want to move, right? So me, like ballroom dance, ballet, they're beautiful dances, and they take extreme discipline and control in your body. Right. And I always wanted to wiggle. Okay. So <laughs> instead of being able to stand like this, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> right? So I know. So they basically were like, You're, this is not for your daughter. Uh -huh. And so I started dancing hip hop. Okay. Like MTV, yeah. when I was growing up, had just come out. Mm. That dates me a little bit because I'm a little old. Um, <laughs> and it was all music, yeah, television, exactly. right? It uh -huh. was all videos. Um, so I would just, I grew up dancing hip hop. Okay. I grew up dancing to... Um, Michael Jackson and Madonna and the Beastie Boys. Okay, yeah. and is that is that because uh, is that the New Jersey influence? You know that the hip hop scene or? Um, I don't know if it was the New Jersey influence or if that was just like the music that I was drawn okay, to. Okay, so like enough. I loved Soul Train. Okay, like I just was always anything that had a beat to it. Uh -huh. I was all about. Okay. Um, I was not a fan of like folk music, which is okay. what my parents listened to. Mm. Um, Peter, Paul, and Mary. I'm like, mm. I needed something with a bass. I needed something with a beat. And okay. I would hear it, and I would move, and I would be happy. Mm. Um, and s that pretty much was it. I was in a bad mood. I'd hear music, and they would it would settle me down. <laughs> okay, I understand that. <laughs> so I was always that way as a child. And then 
Um, I, you know, I danced as a hobby, like, throughout my life. Uh -huh. And then, I think it was 11, 12, I got into martial arts. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I did martial arts for, like, 13 years. Really? 12, 13 years. Oh, anything, like, some specific um, way? I did Okinawan Shoren Ru. Okay, I don't know those. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and I always still danced as a hobby, and then I did martial arts for a long time. And then it got to a point in my life where I had to choose because I was trying to go to college. Mm. I was trying to do, I was actually teaching um, as instructing uh, at a dojo. Dancing or, okay, uh, dojo. martial arts, okay. And martial okay. arts. And then um, I was also trying to dance on the weekends because that was my outlet. Uh -huh. So it got like way too much. And so I was living at that time in like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, going to school, going to college training in martial arts and then on the weekends driving to New York City dancing and then um, trying to it was just way too busy yeah. way too split so, so I, one of my hobbies was martial arts yeah. right so I did um, I think it was like 12 or 13 years for the Okinawan Shoren Room mm. and um, so like I did that in New Jersey uh -huh while I was also dancing. And so when I'm in college, I'm trying to do martial arts, I'm trying to dance socially, and then I'm trying to do my academics. So it didn't go very well, because <laughs> everything was in different places. Right, right, right. Um, dancing was in New York City, and college and martial arts was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania area. So how far was that from you? Um, it was, God, I think it was like couple hours three or? four hour drive wow. okay to new york at okay. that time yeah i would take like route 80 over and um yeah i think it was 80 yeah so but, so so you're doing the martial arts were you still doing hip-hop at that time mm -hmm. okay so okay yeah and so i ended up with a choice i was accepted right out when i was in high school um i won a dance competition like right as i was finishing high school um at a janet jackson concert okay <laughs> And um, it was at Madison Square Garden. Oh, wow. I mean, no, sorry, that's wrong. It was at uh, the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Okay. And it was during the Her Rhythm Nations tour. Remember that? Maybe I do not. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take Nations. your word for it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, it was, so I was at her Janet Jackson concert, and I was in between, like, college and high school. And I got offered to dance in a company in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to go to school in Pennsylvania and trying to do martial arts in Pennsylvania. And it just got to be really overwhelming. Right. And I had my parents in my ear. Oh, no, you can't do dance as a living. You can't make any money as a dancer. You know, you can only do that until you're like 25 or 26. And then you're, you know, you don't have anything. So mm -hmm. I needed to finish school. So... I decided to kind of keep dance as a hobby. Oh. And I did do the company in New York for a short time, but then it became really overwhelming. And um, so then I stopped dancing at that caliber. It was really just socially, I would go out and you know okay, okay. go to like R&B and hip hop clubs. Okay. And um, then from there, I ended up transferring to back to New Jersey and I went to school at Newark, New Jersey in Rutgers. Okay, yeah. And um, during that time, it was, we were in finals. It was either midterms or finals. I don't remember which one it was. But we remember it was exams, and I was tired and cranky. And so my friends were like, oh, let's go dancing. And we went to a Latin club. Ah. And when I was 16, I had um, a Cuban boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And his family taught me Rueda, salsa. Casino? Uh. It was salsa. Okay. So it was what we call now like backyard, yeah, you street know, salsa or? street salsa. Just, you know, we didn't count. We just listened to the yeah, music yeah. and went, right? It was family, family style salsa. Yeah. <laughs> and I went to the club in Newark and I'm like, this is not that. Different. And so I f immediately fell in love with it. And I was like, what are you doing? And how do you do this? And blah, blah, blah. And then that was my rabbit hole into salsa. Mm. And then... Um, Got my education, finished up, and then I ended up moving from New Jersey to the Baltimore area for a job. Oh, okay. And while I was there, I was always dancing. And then I got an illness. I don't know if you know this about me. I have a pacemaker. You told me, okay, you told me this. So when I got sick, I wasn't able to work. And dance actually helped me stay healthy, okay. and it actually helped heal me, and it helped nice. me get stronger. So it took a long time to do that, right? And um, 
so I got the pacemaker and I was working on my health and you know one of the things I told my family at that time is if you end up with a medical condition where dance is the only thing you're really able to do then you're just supposed to dance mm -hmm. you know what I mean yeah. like I couldn't do anything, anything else. else I couldn't drive it couldn't work I, but but somehow I was able to like dance for 15 20 minutes in a day and then I would be in bed but I could still do that okay so I totally you know over years built up a tolerance right, right. and so that's where I started slowly getting healthier and then I started teaching salsa and bachata and um, yeah hey. so that that started my like teaching yeah right and then it was 2011 I was traveling for salsa and I had my team um, we went to Hawaii Salsa Congress and we were performing and I met up with a friend of mine who I had known years before, who was an instructor in Seattle. Uh -huh. His name is Andre Mintz. Okay. And he lived in Seattle and he lived in London. And he was dancing, I was traveling with him and he was dancing with one of his students who was dancing Kizomba. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what's that? And then I had remembered years earlier, there's a couple called uh, Ricardo and Paula, uh -huh. and they are from Afro-Latin Connection. Mm. And years before, I was at the Puerto Rico Salsa Congress in 2002, and they actually taught a Kizomba class okay. at that Congress. Oh, wow. And so that was like the, one of the first classes ever taught in the United States like was for them. Wow. That was 2002. I was like 11, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't even know. I mean, it makes sense. It's been around a long time, but yeah. wow, to actually think about it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I want a, I want a toy truck. What? But Santa Claus. Oh, oh, hold on. One second, Santa Claus. I got. Hold be right back. Uh, hey, if you could leave a like and subscribe for the show, that would be amazing. Uh, let's get back to the episode. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Exactly. I, I wanna. So I really wanna get into all that. <laughs> okay. Um. I want to go back though. Tell me about, tell me about your beginner stage in salsa. What, what was that like? So my beginner stage in salsa was when I was 16, uh -huh. right? And my my boyfriend at the time's family was Cuban, and I just learned with his grandmother and mm. mom and him, and we would dance in the house and listen to music, and I would go over and. I mean, at that time, I was very much into going into the clubs because okay. there were a lot of uh, North Jersey. Um, I lived in Northwest Jersey at the time, but in North Jersey, it was about an hour away from me. There were a lot of clubs that were, um, technically they were 18 to get in and 21 I was to say, drink. were you sneaking in? Okay. Well, so what happened was I'm, I look much younger than I am, <laughs> and I really looked Back much then. younger okay. than, like, like I, there was no way that they, like, would thought I was ID 18. It, I didn't have a fake ID, but... I would go really, really early. Okay, and just right. So when you go early, when the club first opens, they're not really looking at you hard. Right, right, right. And then I got to know all the guys at the door, and I got to know all the people who were at the club. Nice. I never drank. Okay. I never tried to drink. And I was always somehow over the years, as I got older, became the designated driver. Ah. Uh -huh. Not because I didn't drink, but because when I dance, I don't drink because I wasn't there to drink. Okay. I was literally there to dance, okay. and that's all I cared about. So in their heads, there's like, she's just trying to dance. And so there were some clubs that were like 16 to get in. Oh. And it would be like 16 to get in, and then you were supposed to leave at a certain time, and then it would transition into the 18 and older crowd. Okay, okay. And eventually, they all knew me. And so I was in the clubs at 16 in okay. New York City and in North Jersey, and they never, they just stopped carding mm. me. They knew me. Was, um, <laughs> did Jersey have, you know, I guess a... Uh, <laughs> A big Latin population was it a big salsa scene there or I, at that time I wasn't doing salsa okay, at okay. that time I was in all the hip-hop and R&B ah, clubs okay 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 like so, that was my that was my heart and soul ah. so I grew up dancing that like listening okay, to MTV okay. and listening to Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson and the Beastie Boys and I used to do like popping and locking okay. and break dancing oh, and wow. like the whole okay you were into the it. whole yeah, yeah. I, was, I was totally I was totally hip-hop girl mm. um, 
I used to battle like the whole thing. Okay. I loved it. I had. <laughs> <laughs> so you really were about it. I was really all about it. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and one of the things that helped was all the martial arts training because martial arts teaches you control of your body. Exactly, body awareness, right? And body awareness. And so that. I was able to, and I was. So between martial arts and the music, and I've always that and kids. And the hip hop beat. too is so much body awareness and body so, control. Yeah, yeah. So of course. Yeah. So I, like, yeah. So I was like, girl, like, you got too close, you would get an elbow okay. because I was always like, you know, I wasn't couple dancing. Okay. Okay. I was just, you know, hitting the beats. Yeah, <laughs> I understand that. And so that's why I got accepted. That's when I, that was like several years later when I won the competition uh, at the Janet Jackson concert. It was okay, hip hop. Okay, so it was no, hip hop. That makes sense. Yeah. And so and it was those beats that attracted me to Kuduro and Afro House. Okay. Because it was that like bringing me back to that yeah. time. And I'm like, ooh, I remember this. Okay. Oh, it was so good. Okay. So yeah, at first I was just, you know, I just danced. Mm -hmm. Like I said, like family style, kitchen you. style, backyard style, salsa. I didn't know you were supposed to count. Uh -huh. And I danced for like 10 years that way. I said, what? Um, <laughs> I, for the people who maybe grow up in that culture, they probably don't grow up counting either, right? No, they don't. Counting is probably just a something to teach, right? A way yeah, to teach. counting is one of those things that we say, oh, yeah, we don't need to count because we grow up with it and we know how to do it. Right. <laughs> one of the things that I learned was there's the way to not count, and you just have to follow and you have to do the certain things. There's a downbeat right in all of the music mm -hmm. and sometimes it's on one sometimes it's on three sometimes it's on five and sometimes it's on seven so it's the core beat it's that one three five seven and when you're not counting you're usually accenting one of those beats it okay. doesn't always stay consistent right and so what happened was in the 70s and in the 80s um what they called street style salsa became more um, formalized with Eddie Torres on okay. two okay. and the um, what's the Bravo, Junior Bravo the Bravo brothers no the Vasquez brothers in L A okay and so they were teaching on one that's, and that's Eddie the, started yeah. teaching LA on style, two New York style so that's how you ended up getting New York style with Eddie and um, with the Vasco brothers uh, the L A style in California and they were teaching on one and right. the one is the the horns and the singers and you have that like really strong downbeat which is what most Americans and Europeans are used to hearing ah. the on two beat is on the congas and on the clave and the the on the congas they play a rhythm called the tumbao and it goes exactly. boom, batch, mm -hmm. and that bop is that slap and so on two we're emphasizing the slap of the conga mm. right okay so when you don't know how to count. You're just dancing to whatever is the strongest beat. Uh -huh. In some songs, it's an on one beat. Some songs, it's on three. Sometimes, it's on two. So when you're not counting, you're just emphasizing whatever the song is emphasizing, mm. and you don't really care one way or the other. It's so it, the timing changes drastically throughout a song. I understand that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I learned you were supposed to count, and then I was like, oh, my God, and I felt like I had to learn all over again, and then it was restructuring. Mm. And then I learned, that was when I learned on one. And then over time, then I had to learn on two, which then was even more like understanding of the music and the writing and the rhythms yeah. and the instruments and, and how it all connects differently. So now I can dance on all of it. Like yeah. I can dance no counting on one, on two, on three. It doesn't matter. Cause it, like, but now it took time. Of course. You know, and there was a developmental thing of, Ah, oh, you don't count. You just feel the beat. And then a friend of mine was like, "Oh, I'm like, what are you doing?" And I now I know that it was the Suzy Q, which is like a basic, uh, but I didn't it's know. A shine, right? <laughs> right, it's a shine. I had no idea. I was like, "What is that?" Mm -hmm. And they start counting. I'm like, "Why are you counting?" And mm -hmm. they looked at me like, was... "Wait, you dance this? How do you know?" I'm like, "I don't count. I just follow your feet." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's when I realized how much more there was to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> so, so you know, you're going up. Um, you're getting into the sauce, and then you yeah. say you moved to to Baltimore, right? Yeah. Okay. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too deep, but I'm curious. Okay. What um, you know, what's, how did you become sick? What happened? Can I ask about that? Oh yeah. Um. So I have a con I have a c condition. It's the vasovagal nerve. Okay. Which, if you've ever stood up too quickly, 
um, you get dizzy. Or you get dizzy. Uh -huh. So that's your vasovagal nerve, and it's connected to your sympathetic nervous system throughout your body. And my vasovagal nerve tends to misfire. Oh. So if I stand too long, um, if I stand still too long, one of the things that happens is my blood will pull down at my feet. Really? And the way that I can explain it, it's like turning a um, a hose that you have on full blast and just like putting a kink in it. Okay. And all like of a sudden, a there's no with... water, there's no nothing. So what happens is, is my brain doesn't always send a message to my heart and to my bloodstream to pump my blood back up. Wow. Which is why I said dancing for me is good for me because it acts like a manual pump because mm. if my body is moving then you're in motion. Right. So that's pumping my blood and that's keeping me together. When I stand still and just stand and have a conversation, my blood actually rushes like just wow. through gravity and it stays down at my feet. That's crazy. And then I pass out and I have an extreme condition of it where when I pass out, my heart would actually stop. Wow. So I would flatline. Wow. So, um, is Oh, is this something like uh, hereditary or like what? They're not sure. It's mm. like most of the things in my life. I have the extreme version of whatever okay. it is. <laughs> and so, um, as my friends say, you never do anything halfway. Okay. <laughs> you go <laughs> so, all the way in. So I have it all the way. Okay. Um, yeah. And so they say that it normally doesn't really, um, you know, going through your history, they can see it and they can, they, and literally I remember when I was in college one time, I just blacked out, uh -huh. like, and they thought, oh, it was my blood sugar or, you know, I was tired or, you know, you came up with a whole bunch of other reasons right, for why. Right, right. But you can see like through my history now, once I have it, it, how it makes sense, how okay. it connects. But they say that it really hits people when they're in their thirties mm. and it just kind of pops up out of nowhere. And it's a rare condition especially with the extremism of um, the heart stopping. That's hey. not kind of a normal thing. Usually you black out and you wake back up and you're fine and you go about your day. Okay. Um, but for me, everything would shut down. And so, and it's because my blood would be pulled down. I wouldn't have any blood or oxygen to my heart or to my brain. Yeah. So I literally would flatline. And so I guess looking back on it, is this something that you've always had to deal with? Um, looking back on it, it's something that I always... I think was there, but it didn't actually kick in until oh. literally it was oh, I hit 30. Okay. Like I, the, oh. when I was 28, 29, I, I started getting more sick and I didn't understand why. But according to the medical history, like when they look back at it, they're like, when I was younger, I used to go to church with my family. And you know, like in, we're Catholic, so there's stand, that time where you stand up and sit down, you stand up and sit down, and then there's a part in the Mass where they give the homily and you stand that whole time. Okay. I used to get really nauseous oh. during that time. And one of the old names for this disease is called the church disease. Okay. Because people would pass out if they had this when they were standing in church. Wow. And so it's another reason why they said, you know, when I sit, I tend to not sit normal. Like I don't sit like this. I'm usually, my feet are crossed okay. or my leg is up. And also another reason why they're like, you're always just naturally fidgety oh. because I'm naturally moving my blood. And so their body is doing it okay. without me even right, knowing right, about right. it. Okay. And I'm, I was like, I'm, oh, okay. I'm curious. I'm like, even like today, is that something that, I guess, is that something always in the back of your mind? Like I can't stand up too long or like, you know, are you Oh, it's not in the back of, of my hand. I'm, I'm always aware of it. Okay, like if, sure if we were standing and talking, I can only do that for so long and I can feel my body okay. getting um, nauseous. I can feel my body um, like I'll start to slur my words a little bit. Mm. You'll, I can feel when it's happening. I can feel like my blood not pumping back okay. up. So then I sit down or I start moving or I dance or like, like it's, it's not a, it's, it's like somebody who has, I use this all the time, which is kind of a bad analogy, but a good analogy. You know, somebody who has like a food allergy mm -hmm. or somebody who's allergic to peanuts, it's okay. just something that they just allergy. adjust to mm -hmm. and they know. And so when it's around, they have their thing and they just give them themselves a shot and they keep going on their way. Mm -hmm. That's what this is for me, right? So um, I now have my second pacemaker. Okay. The last one I had replaced in 2016. So it's, it, it's not like a, a thing that hinders me. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of always there. Right. And I have, to, I have to be careful about my energy level. I have to be careful about um, how much stress I have, which right. is why I live on the beach. Hey. <laughs> um, I have to be careful just 
making sure that I try to balance stuff out because if I don't, I black out. Right. The good news is that I always say, I'm like, well, if I black out now, I have the pacemaker, so I will wake up. Okay, so sure enough, right. Right, where before, without it, I went three years without, without a pacemaker, wow. and I got very, very sick because it was like a, a bad computer, you know, like when you have to take the battery out on your laptop and then put it back in right. to restart it, and it always would lose data. So I just got sicker and sicker okay. and sicker, mm. and I was down to like 86 pounds at one point. Okay, wow. I, I'm very curious, um, you know, I guess, knowing what you know now about this, yeah. how does this affect, you know, I guess your teaching at all? So, I imagine a big portion is you on your feet, right? Moving around, is that? Well, yeah, okay. so I'm moving around, Okay, that's right? good, okay. Um, and then in any classes where I talk a lot, you'll see me walk that or right? I'll sit. Okay. Right? Um, for me, it doesn't necessarily affect, I think, how I physically teach, mm -hmm. but it affects my connection to teaching and mm -hmm. to music and to dance. Um, part of the studio, right, the Mamba Room, which is where we're at now, one of the reasons I wanted to open up a studio and one of the reasons why I partnered with Tracy and Dorian is because they have a similar vision for dance. For me, dance is about healing. Dance is about connecting. Dance is about a way of expressing. Right. Dance is supposed to be a safe place to be, right? So one of my passions is working with at-risk youth. I love working with teenagers and specifically teenagers that kind of have had um, a rough beginning mm -hmm. or have a rough life. Yeah. Or, um, and one of the reasons is, is because I want them to be able to have a space to feel. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. as dancers, we have a saying, you leave it on the floor. So if you're angry, I want you to dance out that anger. Okay. If you're happy, I want you to be able to dance out that happiness. If you're sad, I want you to be able to cry when you dance and get it out. Mm -hmm. And so dance is a place, that's why I say it's a place of healing. For me, it was a place of physical healing. It was also a place of emotional healing um, because it was where I was able to, to be able to heal, okay. right? Yeah. Like I spent, you know, my close friends know I spent close to two years in bed, Okay. right? I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I was blacking out and then I would lose days and it was, it was a mess. But dance slowly over time helped me build that up. Okay. And I've always had such a passion for dance. And so now like on a simple version, if you move, right, you're in the military or you're going to college or whatever, you got a new job someplace and you don't know anybody and you go to a dance studio well, or you go to a dance it. community, you all of a sudden know somebody. Right? And nobody cares what color you are. Right. Nobody cares how old you are. Nobody cares how much money you make. Nobody cares what car you drive. All they want to know is, what's your name? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to dance? If you don't know how to dance, do you want to learn how to dance? If you don't want to learn how to dance, we kind of look at you side-eyed. Right. If you do want to learn how to dance, we get very excited and we start helping you to learn on the side on right. how to teach you. Yeah. Right? Even if they're not a teacher, you will see people helping other people dance. There is dance in every country, every state in the United States, almost every country in the world. I believe it. And I say all the time when I teach, like when I give history and about different cultures and things, there is dancing in every country that I know of. The only one I don't know if there's dancing is North Korea. Okay. That's it, right? Sure there enough. is a Salsa Congress in Alaska. Yes. There is a Kizomba Festival in... Um, in Russia, in, in Thailand, Iceland. there's one in Iceland. There's, you know, there is salsa in Kenya. Kenya's there. Our salsa is everywhere. So, I interview people. Right. And, salsa. and Kiz so salsa is everywhere. Huge. Bachata is everywhere. Kizomba is is being attached to that, and Kizomba is. is growing. So I'm like, it's almost everywhere, right? Even little tiny pockets of places you have. Salsa and bachata always, and now you're starting to have kizomba. Mm -hmm. And for me, I don't need to know how to speak your language. I've been able, like, I've been to India, dance salsa. Hey. I don't know Hindu. Is that a universal language or something, right? It is a completely universal language. You know, they have it in China. They have it like everywhere, right? So when I went to Portugal to train, I don't speak Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Some most of the classes were taught in Portuguese. Right. I don't know what they're saying, but I can visually see, okay, they're moving their foot here, they're doing this, and I could take the classes. It's the same thing. It, it is a, 
dance is a form of communication. Definitely. You know, and for me, one of the reasons, like I said, that Tracy and I did this is because I wanted to create a space for people to heal. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's going through a divorce okay. and needs, you know, an outlet. Like, you know, when you're married and you, you are, you're in a long-term relationship and you have a breakup, all of a sudden friends don't know who to go and talk to and you need a new, you know, you need a new space. You need yeah. something else to do that isn't associated with your past or with your partner. Yeah. Dance can be that place. Um, you know, I've had people, I've had students who have lost family members who have come and used dance to heal. My own health problems, I've used dance to heal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're in the military and you travel and you get, you know, relocated from right. one place to another, yeah. you know, you came from here and then you went to New Orleans. Right. You found a dance community there. Yeah, now yeah. you're back, you find the dance community. Like, dance is that universal community, right? Okay. I can go anywhere in the world, find the dancers, and I will have a couch to sleep on if I need it. Sure enough. I definitely so, understand that, yeah. It's true. Like, I, that to me is, like, priceless. Mm, I, I can understand as well. You say, like, um, I guess somewhere to heal, because this is, um, I guess it's kind of been therapeutic for you as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. for your rehabilita yeah. rehabilitation process. Mm -hmm. So I definitely understand that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so for me, I connect to music and to dance, I think, differently than most people. Because okay. for me, I believe strongly that I would not be here without mm. dance. Like, I physically wouldn't be here. Because if okay. you think about it, I flatlined every time I passed out. Mm. So for me, dance was something that I was able to heal. It was what helped me get out of bed. Yeah. Right, 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 right. It helped me get motivated to get out of bed because I loved it so mm. much. Because I was that child that always had to dance. And it also physically helped me, right? Because by moving, it acted like a manual pump, right. which then helped me circulate my blood, right, which right, helped right. me heal, which helped me get stronger. Mm. I've actually, I've heard that, well, I've heard that, you know, um, movement is kind of how the body heals itself. Mm -hmm. That's walking because it's how yeah. the body circulates the blood exactly. and everything. So I've definitely heard that yeah. as well. I, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, like, with kids that I've worked with, right, like, when you talk about, like, we had the class today, right, the right. Kizoma class. And we were talking about how, you know, Kizoma could be, like, a therapy class for definitely. married couples, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when you're leading someone, when I teach a class with kids, Right? I talk about how you ask someone to go from one place to another. You don't just pull them across. Right? If you pull them across and you force it, it's like somebody's yelling and screaming at you in your Definitely. face. So you want to be able to communicate. So then all of a sudden, kids who aren't used to hearing about communication in a certain way then understand physically what the differences are. You know, This is what is the result of somebody yelling at you. Mm. This is the result of somebody asking you. This is how I can get into your space respectfully yeah this is how i'm getting into your space disrespectfully so different ways of communicating. all of a sudden they're learning um appropriate touch appropriate spacing appropriate communication um you know when i lead you lightly this is us having a conversation when i lead you forcefully this is me you know bullying you yeah so all of those aspects i get to then teach to kids and it's more, it's life lessons and it's communication. And also, you know, you have kids that build self-esteem that Definitely. were quiet and didn't know they could do something. And then all of a sudden they have something they can do, Yeah. you know, and it builds confidence and it builds security. I've watched people come in who, um, who had low self-esteem and wouldn't even look up and just kind of would look down and be quiet and, and not say anything. And now they're on stage. Hey. You know, and yeah. you see that growth and you're just like, ugh, because you feel like dance should bring out the best version of you. Mm. That to me is when I've done my job. Right, right. You know, right. it takes time. Of course. And everyone has their own dance, right? Some people like salsa, some people like bachata, some people like kizomba or samba. Um, do you know, some people like mix fit or zumba or right, jazz right. size. Yeah, like yeah. i don't really care swing big swing yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. um you know two-stepping yeah um cha-cha like i don't you know blues whatever it is that makes you have a passion for right, it right, right that then i'm happy for you that you yeah. find it that that to me is not important what it's just that you do mm -hmm. no, i understand <laughs> that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. i definitely understand that i want to um you know i want to kind of talk about you know, so you moved to Baltimore, mm -hmm. and then um, you said you first got introduced to Kizomba in Hawaii, is that right? 
So the first time I got introduced to it was in 2002 mm -hmm. with Afro Latin Connection. Okay. And I saw it and I was there and I'm like, okay. And then I just kind of put it on a burner okay. because at the time I started getting into On Two Salsa. Okay. And that's when I was like, oh. and Frankie Martinez was there and he performed, who is, if you guys don't know who he is, look him up. Mm. Like he's, <laughs> Abuqua. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, so I was like really head into that. Okay. Like that's where my passion right. was. So I was exposed to it, but I didn't really like, I don't want to say take it seriously, but I just didn't look at it as a genre that I wanted to at that time train in. Okay, I understand. Right? Like, yeah. I didn't want to go into it fully because I was already fully committed to on two, and right. really that's where my brain was. So then in 2011, when I saw it, I was like, what is this? Mm, and yet. then I remembered, wait, that's that thing. Right, because you get exposed to it, and a couple of years later, what is that? Like almost a decade right, later. Right, it's nine years, right? <laughs> it was like nine years. I'm like, oh, wait, I remember. And then it was like, oh, and then I was like, oh my God, what is this? And mm. I want to learn it. And so that was then. And then at that time, the only person that I knew that was really teaching it at a intricate level was Anna Natus, who was from Seattle. Okay. And she really much, very much like founded that Seattle scene. And there are some really good instructors there, Shannon, Mario, Francis, um, that she helped grow mm. and influence and train and, you know, really like helped. Like she is, most people don't know her in the dance scene because she's not a performer. She doesn't consider herself okay. an instructor. She's just somebody who really loved it and grew up doing it mm. and I, wanted people to do it with her. I say I would never uh, imagine Seattle had a, a, an amazing scene or amazing teacher of all places in the United States. Yeah, Seattle, you're like, wait, what? Yeah, but right. she's Portuguese and Angolan, mm. and she grew up dancing it and wanted people to dance with her, so she started to teach people so that she could have people right. to dance she with. She built her own community. And then that's kind of how that, and then Andre had been in London, and he knew it, so he helped foster it, and then it started to grow mm. there. And so um, when I came back from that traveling trip, um, I started doing more traveling, and then it was like a year later almost, like the summer of 2012, uh -huh. where I met Carla Poma. Okay. And she had just come back recently from, I think, like eight months in Europe. Mm. Okay. Right, and she was like, go to Europe and then come back, go to back to Europe, and she was really instrumental in my initial what I call like rabbit hole okay <laughs> like my my like journey into it okay. so she she um, was here for the DC bachata Congress and uh -huh. she taught there uh -huh. and so I talked to her and this was after I had been exposed and Andre was trying to teach me and I had questions that they couldn't answer and there were other instructors locally that I had questions that they couldn't answer so she introduced me to um, at events, uh -huh. and then like two weeks later, Petchu and Vanessa, who Petchu is considered, you know, we call him the father of Kizomba, not because he created or invented Kizomba, but he was one of the initial instructors that taught outside of the Angolan community. Mm. And he had a company called, he still has this company called Kilandu Kilu, which is a tribal company, um, ballet company for Angola. And they were in Portugal. Oh. And he ended up staying in Portugal. And um, he created the syllabus. So we call the basic one, the basic one, the basic two, the basic three, the Virgula, the Saidas, because of how Pechu sat okay. down and described it and wrote it out. like he gave those things like the names. Like a pedagogy, I guess, pedagogy. Yeah, like he gave those things the names. Okay. Like he, so we call him the father because pretty much almost everyone who's teaching, if they didn't train with him, they mm. train with somebody who did train okay. with him, who trained with him. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like six degrees of separation, mm -hmm. it goes back to Pechu. Okay, sure enough. Right. Now, there were other people that were teaching, right. but the systematic way that it was structured really came from you trying to work it all out okay. and figuring out what's the best way and what did we do and he literally drew out like the drawings and like he has them in his house like when he drew everything out and how he did it and it was really cool to see 
And um, so it was his first time here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. This is back in 12? Yes, yeah, this was 2012. And so I went to New York and I didn't really, I knew a little bit, but I didn't really know a lot. And um, so I took privates with him. Right. I took privates with Vanessa and they invited me to come to Portugal. Mm. So then I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> I needed a excuse like it's Tuesday to travel. Hey. <laughs> so I then like went to Portugal nice. and I went and trained with Afro Latin Connection first. Um, I was there for in Porto, um, so I was there for a couple of weeks, and then I went to Lisbon and I took Pechu's instructor training course for Kizomba and Semba, and then did another specialty class for Semba after mm. that. And um, at that time, wasn't planning on teaching. At that time, I was just trying to work out the whole dancing, right? Okay. So I wasn't, I didn't take the instructor training course to teach but I took it to understand and to get better at the dance, right? So when I left, I didn't start teaching because that was really early. And so it was a year and a half later when I actually started to teach. So 13, 14? Yeah, well, it was like middle fall of 2013, okay. mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, and this was like December, of 2012 when I went to mm. Portugal. Okay. And so it was like the fall of 2013 that I started. Okay. I wanna, I, I wanna hear about all that. Um, I'm very curious to hear, tell me about, you know, I guess what drew you so much to Kizomba? Like, was it the music or? It was the music. Was it? It was the straight, it was the music. I, I fell in love with the music. Okay. I was like, what is this? And how do you dance to it? Okay. But that was my same reaction when I first started dancing salsa, when I went to the salsa club. I was like, what is your feet doing uh -huh. to this beat, okay. right? Because I, I knew the music, but that's not how my body moved to it, okay. right? So then for me, it was like, oh, I loved this music, and now you're doing a new foot thing to it. How do you do that? Uh -huh. Where Kizomba, the music impacted me, and I didn't understand the music. So... When I first took classes with Eddie and when I first took classes with Petchu, I was like, I actually didn't take dance classes. We sat down and I talked about the music. Okay. And they were like, and I'm like, no, I don't understand what I'm listening to. I don't understand the, like, the I don't language understand. language barrier or? It wasn't the language barrier. It was the music that I'd never heard before. Mm. Right? So if I'm used to hip hop and I was used to salsa and bachata, all of a sudden, there's this whole new genre of music of kizomba and semba, right. tarashinya. Now, tarashinya and garazuk have that heavy R and B influence, right? right? Exactly. It has that heavy bass. So this like brings me back to when I was a kid and when I was like doing the, you know, the hip hop right. and in the clubs when I'm like 16 and you know dancing in New York City. And now all of a sudden, I'm getting introduced to this music, and I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And it had such a rich um, like it, you could tell they were all related. Uh huh. Okay. I just couldn't understand what it was. Like mm -hmm. I didn't know how they were related. Like how Tarashinya or Kuduro or Kizomba or Semba. Like I could hear like a a lineage, right? Uh -huh. But I didn't understand it. I didn't know what made one what, what made one this. I didn't know how you danced it. Mm. I didn't understand like. I, I was just confused by it, but I was not only just confused, it was in a really good way. I was really like drawn to it and I was really hungry for the information okay. to understand the music yeah. because the music is what always makes me want to move. Okay. Right. And so then it was like, so I did, like I took lots of privates when they were first here on the music and then I took the group classes on the steps okay. right because I'm like I can get that from mm. the group shot the group yeah. classes right the group workshop but there was nothing that I could understand like you know when you listen to a beautiful slow samba right like a samba lento mm -hmm. a slow samba and you listen to a kizomba there's a difference right but when you first don't know it to you, it kind of sounds the same, but I could tell that there was a difference. I just didn't understand what it was. Mm -hmm. I understand right? that, yeah, yeah. Or when you listen to a Semba, like a Semba Carnival, right, which is like Casa uh -huh. I didn't even know that Casa Kuta was a thing. Okay. Right? But Casa is like the music that they play at Carnival, 
and it has a samba rhythm, but it's, it, it's specifically a genre called Kazakuta. I, I could tell that Kazakuta and samba were related, but I didn't know how. Uh. I didn't know the vocabulary to even put those together. Okay. So I was very like intrigued and interested and drawn to the music, but very confused about what it all was. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Yanu, what is this? Mm -hmm. right, right, right. <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah. really where it started. Mm -hmm. And then the more I learned, the more I got into the dance. And then I fell in love with the dance and I fell in love with the feel of Kizomba. Okay. Oh, that yumminess, that smoothness. I say it's for a different, a different feel than what salsa or bachata, right? Yeah, it's for me completely different than any other dance right, that I dance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, let me ask you this. Um, it sounds like, you know, in your search to find out about the music, you probably found out about the culture as well, correct? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, why is it important for maybe an instructor or someone learning? Why is it important to not only know the steps of a dance, but also the culture? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> for me, I did the same research and the same kind of history and the same search for the culture that I did in salsa mm -hmm. and bachata as I did for kizomba and samba. Um, for me, all of the dances start with the music. Right. The music comes from the people and the music comes from the culture. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It to me they are not separated. Okay. So for me to for a person to understand the music, you have to understand the culture. Mm. Once you understand the music and the culture, then you can understand the steps. Okay. If not, then there's no difference between me dancing a salsa step to country western music, right? Because it's a 4-4. Okay. I, and I have. Like, I did a choreography one time to Poison. Okay. You know, by Belle Bivio. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. right? You did what? Uh, what type a salsa role? choreo. Okay. <laughs> right? Because it's that. a 4-4 four beat. Four, okay. Four beat okay. Right? So, I, you know, I was bored, and I wanted to do a hip-hop because I like hip-hop. So I decided to do a salsa choreography to that. So... When you have steps, if it's just steps, then you can remove that and dance them to anything. anything okay. Right? But if you're going to dance to a music and you're going to understand what you're doing, then you need to relate it for me personally. Uh -huh. I need to relate it to the culture. And I think that has to do with the fact that because I was a military brat, and we moved around a lot, and I saw and was exposed to a lot of different types of cultures. I've always been interested in different cultures and in different um, ways that people do things. Okay. And so for me, the culture and the music are together. Mm -hmm. So for me, culture is music, mm -hmm. which is then the dance, right? So when you find a music that you love, I want to know where it comes from. I want to know the people that created it. I want to know like the inspiration behind it. I want to know what was going on in that time frame when it was created, mm -hmm. right? Like, and it was the same thing that I did with salsa. So uh, for example, I have a dance company called Yamashun, right? We yeah. talked about that right. before. Yeah. The reason I, like some people hear it and they think, oh, it's Japanese, right? And I'm like, no, 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 it's Cuban, but it's more Santeria. So Yamaya is uh, the goddess and the Orisha of the ocean. Oshun, also pronounced Ochun, depending on what country you're, you know, from, is the goddess of the rivers and the lakes, so the smaller bodies of water. So Yemashun is where the river goes to see her mother, mm -hmm. right? Where Ochun or Oshun goes to see Yemaya, where the river meets the ocean. I wanted a name when I was creating my salsa dance company that had its history and its roots where salsa comes from in okay, Cuba, right? Right. I didn't want to just call it something corporate or commercial mm. or because for me, I love this music and I love the, the culture. So it was important to always kind of pay respect to that. Mm -hmm. So during my time of learning dance, like I said, I mean, I first started 
right? Not knowing you counted. Once I learned you had to count, I was like, oh my God. So then it was, I learned on one, then I learned on two, then I learned Afro-Cuban, and then you learn the Orisha movements, and it's all part of it, mm -hmm. and it's all integrated into it. And then you're learning Rueda, or uh, Casino, right. which is, you know, a salsa dance as a partnership, the movements that you would use in Rueda, mm -hmm. exactly. right? So all of those different genres, you know, all those different ways, they each have their own culture. Bomba from, from Puerto Rico, right? With the skirts and okay, the movements, right? right, right. right? Mm -hmm. It's very similar to uh, rumba, mm -hmm. right? In Cuba. Right, okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went down that same kind of cultural search mm -hmm. in the music of salsa as I did is in kizomba and samba. And so um, for me, the way that you dance it you you need to understand need the to. culture mm. for me that but that's how i relate to it okay. that's how i pull from it right yeah. which is why when i teach i often talk about the culture or i often talk about the music because without it i wouldn't have the dance steps mm. and i also feel like you the more you understand about the culture the more you understand about the people that created the music and that the culture comes from then the closer you are to actually being able to dance the dance. Okay. Right? So and you say being able to dance it, being able to dance it in its traditional form, maybe you're saying, or what do you mean, or? No, I mean all of it. Like, okay, so um, I'll use salsa as an example. Salsa on two. Mm -hmm. I love it, right? That's the way I prefer to dance my salsa. However, I know how to dance casino. Mm -hmm. I know how to dance for Weyla. I know how to dance Afro-Cuban. I know how to dance some of the Orishas. I don't know all of them, right? Because I don't specialize in them. Mm -hmm. But I understand them, and I understand their history and their roots. For me, I am not saying to somebody who is from Cuba, salsa on two is how you're supposed to dance salsa. Okay, okay, right, right, right. right, right. I can't go to Col Colombia, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Where they dance cumbia or Mexico where they dance cumbia and cumbia is huge and I can't look at them and say oh that's not salsa mm. that's just wrong right right, right. right? that uh -huh. is just so culturally like jacked up you just shouldn't do something like that but there are people that don't understand the differences and they don't understand so they'll be like oh well you don't know how to dance salsa why because they're on one or because they're dancing cumbia or because they're dancing like a Colombian style like no so I tell people all the time, like, uh, salsa is like Spanish. Okay, different. Right? It is spoken differently and danced differently in Cuba. It is spoken differently and danced differently in Puerto Rico, right. the Dominican Republic, and in Spain. But right. you can't tell somebody in Spain that they don't know how to speak Spanish. Okay. Right? It's not, you just, what are you doing? So <laughs> I said, when in fact, they all probably can still communicate with each other. Yeah, you can. Like, I can dance all those different styles, right? right? I specialize, my, my drive, my passion is on two mm -hmm. because that's what I feel the strongest okay. connection right, to right. personally. That doesn't mean that any of other those styles are not as respected and not as legit and, mm -hmm. and actually on two comes from them. Right. right. Right? Right, right, right. So I can't look at somebody and be like, oh, well, you dance son, so you don't know what you're doing. It would be no mambo. There would be no salsa on exactly. without salsa. Without, mm -hmm. right? right, right, right. So, for me, that's kind of what's important, right? It's like understand your history, understand where these dances come from, and then if you particularly like one over the other, that's fine. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing for for me for kizomba. So, the more I learned and the more I got into the culture and the more I learned about Angola and the more I learned about the um, the the development of the country and the you know the war with Portugal and their their independence and the civil war all of that plays into effect mm -hmm. you know when you're dancing Semba and when you're dancing Kizomba and when you're dancing Tadashinya like like culturally there are certain things that that happened and then went around that makes sense to me, you know? Like even by, um, okay, so Brio, right? We talked about right. Brio. Brio Judah, right. amazing dancer. Fantastic, right? He teaches sukus and he teaches African body yeah, movement, yeah, yeah. right? So 
you know, him and I talked about it one time because when he was back home and a lot of people that I know that are of African descent, they tend to walk with their feet like this, okay. right? When they would sit and wait for a bus, they would squat and they would hang out and have a conversation and their feet would be like this. Now, this is something that's part of the culture, mm-hmm. right? Um, can I go and can I show you or yeah, is it like walk too far? But no, just right here. Oh, yeah, uh, will it show in the video? I don't know. Hmm. I don't think it'll pick up your feet. Actually, it's showing my feet, so we'll try it out though. We'll see. So okay. So like what I'm saying is, is they'll they'll wait like for this. Okay, they'll okay. wait for the bus like this. Okay. Right? Or they'll be talking and they'll be standing and they'll Squatted instead of standing down. they'll just sit like okay. they'll sit yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So that so that your knees aren't jacked up, your your feet are bent. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Right, so you have, yeah, it's like a duck walk, oh, yeah, right, right? right? But it's not like anybody's waddling like right, a duck, right. but it's like when you're hanging out, waiting for your stationary, you're like this, right? And culturally, this is kind of how, you know, if you watch Brio, he'll sit like this for okay. forever. Okay, like, yeah. and this is for him, is like not a big thing, uh-huh. right? For us in the U.S., We'll sit down on the ground and we'll cross our legs. Right, we're not gonna be squatting though. We're not gonna squat. This is not like a thing. Um, <laughs> but there it is. Yeah, yeah. Right. Part of that has to do with um, where he's from. Okay, right, right. When you think about when we think about um, some of the villages in Africa or some of the environments in Africa, and, and it's not as paved or you know different roading and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna sit down in the grass or we're gonna sit down on the sidewalk. We're not sitting down in like the wooded area, mm-hmm. right? Right. So that's part of the culture, right? Brio is from Kenya, right? But it's similar, not necessarily in the cities, but similar in in some of the countryside, in Angola and in, in several other um, African countries, mm-hmm. right? So I have other friends that are of their African descent, and they all tell me that they do the same thing. Okay. The reason I bring that up is because when we dance kizomba, this is how my feet are. Yeah, you can see that. Do you know what I mean? If you watch the Angolan women with their feet, their feet are like this. Okay. And then of course it straightens out and it goes side and it does things like that depending on, you know, when we're walking towards the guy, our foot is pointed in towards the man. So part of understanding that helps you understand why your feet would be set up like this okay because if this is how you stand you're not going to stand like this Mm -hmm. but in western society we're taught like yoga and pilates and we pull our hips in and we're aligned and our feet are like this and everything is in alignment when you dance kizomba this way it feels different and it feels stiff Mm -hmm. and you wonder why a woman who is angolan her hips move differently it's because her body and her feet are positioned differently. Right, right. So just understanding something like that with the culture mm-hmm. can translate into how it actually physically happens in the dance. So, all right, so let me ask you this, man. Um, say for someone who is just, you know, wants to have a good time, mm-hmm. and, you know, they're, is, is learning the culture, is that for maybe someone who wants to become more of an advanced dancer, someone who just wants to go out dance on a Saturday night? You know, and they just, they just need to know the basic and, and get to go, or? Okay, so probably, yes. Okay. <laughs> However, for my students, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just know that for me, for me to get you to understand the feel of it and to be able to dance it, me, my understanding of the culture helps me teach it. Right? I can understand it for a teacher, definitely. I definitely understand that. But when you're asking me questions about, well, do my feet go here? Or do my feet go here? For a teacher, I, I need to be able to explain that to you, right? Mm-hmm. Is it important for you to understand those details? No. But now that I showed you that and we talked about that moment, mm-hmm. your feet or your partner's feet is going to be more likely to be like this. Yeah. Right? And you have something, I guess, to connect to a why. Right. right? You have a why. why yeah, you have a okay. why. Right? Okay. So. If you're just going to learn steps because you just want to have a good time, for me, it's like it takes me, what, an extra three minutes to explain part of the culture while I'm explaining the why of the dance. And if it helps you dance better, then you learn it. Okay. Now, some people don't care, Mm -hmm. and they just want to learn the steps. 
but for me, I feel like for somebody who's doing that, you're also never, I don't want to say never because that could be, I could be wrong, but it's more unlikely that you'll ever really get the feel of the dance. Okay. And for me, Kizomba, the feel of Kizomba is so unique and so special um, that I don't even understand. It's hard for me to understand why somebody wouldn't want to feel that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, um, you know, the matrix. You choose the red pill or the blue <laughs> pill. Which rabbit hole you want to go? You can right. go on this one. Mm -hmm. And in, in that case, you know, you can you could go on YouTube and learn that. Right. You don't, but to understand the feel of it, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing to be able to do a step. It's another thing to be able to connect it, to communicate and to lead it and to follow it mm -hmm. with another human being. Okay. Right. Yeah. One helps you understand how to do that. The other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I use in a lot of analogies when I teach, I'll use Spanish. If you learn Spanish in a school, and you only learn the academic Spanish and you learn proper, right. all of that mm. stuff, right? You don't understand the culture. You don't understand how anybody actually talks. And then someone lets you loose mm. in a Hispanic or a Spanish speaking country. Yeah. You can you get, get by, by yeah, but there's so much more to the language, but so much more to the language, right? Yeah. So one, you get by and the other one you can actually integrate. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Um, so let me ask you this then, you know, since we're on this subject, um, mm -hmm. give me, I would like to, give, can you give me some, you know, tips on maybe how someone can improve their walk? Yes. So for leads, y'all all need a Broomhilda. Like so really, please, everybody please. needs a Broomhilda. <laughs> so please explain what is a Broomhilda. I'm like, we should go get a Broomhilda. Okay. Um, a Broomhilda is your best dance partner ever. She's even better than me or anybody else because... <laughs> It is a broom, I remember this. <laughs> right? I had you do Definitely. Broomhilda, right? You and Broomhilda, but it helped you, right? Of course. Yeah. So Broomhilda is a broom, a stick, or anything else that you're holding here, and you learn to walk, okay. and you learn to lead it, whether you're here and you're going forward and you keep her center, or you go bring her to the side, or you leave her here and you go to the side. It helps you navigate how to move your hands, uh -huh. and when you're moving here, and when you can go straight, and also allows you to play with the timing of the music, how to go slow, how to go fast, mm. how to syncopate if you want to syncopate. Okay. All of those things, when you're dancing with Brumhilda, you'll see, does she tilt? Mm. Did I do this with my hand? Did I do that with my hand? I need to pretend as if Brumhilda is my follow. So right. if Brumhilda wants to go over here, you can't just look at her. You mm. have to move her. Right. If you want Broomhilda to stay over here or you're here and you want to exit out, that means you need to leave Broomhilda here and you exit out and your hand stays there. Okay. So for a lead, Broomhilda. <laughs> that probably helps improve your frame as well, it right? It improves frame your seven. frame, your posture, your lead, your timing, because then you can play with the slow, you can go with the fast. You can play with learning to move your arms at a different pace than your footwork, yeah, okay. right? Yeah, so you can yeah. do like some of the footwork and stuff like that. Like they do, like they pretend, um, you know, like a lot of the footwork comes from football or exactly. like soccer, soccer right. right? You'll see it, you know, and you'll do like the syncopations and the slides or whatever. And you're like, wee, or you do the little like drawing, yeah. you know, calligraphy on the floor, whatever you want to do, right? The alphabet, zoom, zoom, zoom with your foot, right? <laughs> All of that you can do with Brumhilda. Mm -hmm. As a follow, you really need to be able to practice walking and transferring your weight completely from one foot to another before you're stepping. So as I'm here, I want to make sure that my footwork is staying as I'm sliding along the floor, like my weight is here. And then when I get to where I need to be, then I shift. So, so for people who might, who might be listening, you're saying um, from your... Ball of the ball foot. foot to the to the heel. Is that what you're saying? It, not just from the ball of the foot to the heel. So literally from the ball of your foot. If my weight is on my left foot, for example, uh -huh. and I'm going to do my basic three, I'll use that so that everyone has a standard of what I'm talking about. My weight is on my left foot. I'm sliding on the ball of my foot to whatever position uh -huh. I'm supposed to be bringing my foot back to, right? So in a basic three, that's back. Right. And then I roll from the ball of the foot all the way to the heel, okay. and I put my weight in the center part of my foot, mm. right? If I'm dancing urban, for example, your foot is going to, your weight is going to stay more forward so that you can syncopate. 
But with Kizomba and Samba, your weight is actually in the center part of your foot. You're using your whole foot because you're grounded to the, to the floor, mm -hmm. right, and to the earth. So as you step, but I don't want to put my weight on it halfway through my move. Okay, right, right, I right. want to keep it on my left until my foot gets to exactly where I want it to go and then I shift my weight. And now my weight is released on my left foot and I can slide that one back to however far I want it mm. to go back to. And then I shift my weight and I put it completely on the other foot. So, so, oh, so real quick, you said a lot right there. Um, trying to just so I can make someone understand it. So different, very different than like a sauce step where you're stepping on and you're slowly transitioning that weight transfer yeah right and look at why so in salsa we're lifting our foot mm. and we're landing on the beat right right when that beat lands you need to be on it right right we are dancing on top of the beat kizomba we're dancing with the beat we're like inside it almost okay. so in kizomba i get there but I don't actually complete my transfer until just before the beat leaves, mm. right? So that's a different part of the beat. In salsa, I get there at the top part of the beat, as the beat leaves. In kezomba, I get there as the beat starts to leave. So I'm getting there at the end of the beat. Okay. There, it, it feels like a delay, right? Because you're not, like in, in salsa, it's almost like you're chasing it to land on it. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand that. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. In Kizomba, the beat goes and then you get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, I also feel like that's part of the culture, right? Um, we, we're like on it, on the beat, on the beat, on the beat. Kizomba, I like to say I get to go on vacation when I dance okay. Kizomba. I'll get there. Okay. And yeah. I get there right before the bee leaves. So, yeah, so, so yeah, no, no rush for you, <laughs> There's right? no, rush. no rush. It's just relaxed, and you just, you, you, you go with it, mm -hmm. right? Kizomba, we talked earlier about, well, not in the podcast, but about, like, my nickname, right? And I love to teach on the beach because on the beach, you can't rush the beat. Right. When you're dancing in the water, you can't rush it. You still get there. Mm -hmm. But you're like, get there, and then it starts to kind of just finish off, and then you go, right? It's not like you're running to it. Right. Get there. Right. And it literally is like a beach vacation. You're like, eh, I'm going to get there. And there is this, um, I had this great conversation one time with Adori and with Jamba separately and another friend of mine as well. The Angolans have a thing. <laughs> and I literally call it the Angolan step. And Everyone I know who is Angolan feels this way at a certain point in the music. Okay. And there is like this hesitation almost. There is this weightedness to the step. And it used to confuse the living daylights mm. out of me. And I was like, I am going to Angola and learning this step. Okay. And I did. I figured it out. But there is like a hesitation. And that hesitation is that like, huh. I'll get there. Okay. And it's a sink into the floor and it's a sink into your partner that is very unique to what I consider authentic Kizomba okay. dancers, right? Yeah. And, and, and Angolan dancers. Every Angolan dancer I know does it mm. at some point in time. And they all were like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do this okay. thing. Okay, that's something they just... It, they just do it right, naturally. Right, right. It's just a thing that they do, right. and they don't even... It's not a, a conscious thing. Right. And I've had conversations with other um, female instructors, and they're like, oh, yeah, they do do that thing. And okay. I'm like, they do this thing. And that thing is that, like, weightedness, and that, like, it feels like... You're kind of there, but you're just like, oh, I'll get there in a second. Okay. Or oh, I'll leave in a second. Give me a moment. And, it, and it's just this so much fun and this, like, connectedness to the floor and to the music that is different than any other dance. Mm. So um, I guess I want to say your background in salsa maybe tried to influence your kizunga. And what I, what I mean is um, I guess what I want to say is, you know, understanding that Kizumba is its own dance. It's completely different than yeah. anything else you might know, right? You yeah. have to differentiate it. Completely. You can't yeah. bring something else into it, right? No, right. I don't. Um, yeah, you can't. <laughs> right. um, 
the the one part that I bring to kizomba that is similar to salsa is the way that I teach and how I break things down. Okay. Right. Because I have experience breaking things down in salsa and bachata, learning to break things down in kizomba was much quicker. I feel like for me mm -hmm. than for other people, but only because I have experience in teaching. Mm -hmm. um, the dance itself, though, took me a long time to get. Okay. Like it. I. I mean, I did. I trained for hundreds and I don't even know how many hours at this mm. point I've been on the floor but you know the first uh the first couple of years I had hundreds and hundreds of hours okay. on the floor dedicated yeah yeah, yeah. and I love it hey yeah. take me uh take me back to you know fall of 13 when you started teaching tell me tell me about your you know your beginner stage in teaching what was that like <laughs> so there was a festival in S San Francisco it was either in San Francisco or San Diego. I don't remember what it was. But I had just come back from spending two plus months in Europe. Okay. So what I used to do, so through 2012 and 2013 and through 2000 and, well, yeah, from 2012 to 2015, I actually would go to Portugal for a couple of months and then I would come back for a couple of months and then I would go back for okay. a couple of months. Yeah, just, so just to train? Or? Just to train. Like I, I didn't go for like a weekend. I didn't go for a festival, right? I went literally and I would stay like months at a time and I would train in between and then I would go to some of the congresses. But most of my training happened in between the weekends, mm. right? Where I was doing privates and group classes and lots and lots of individual training on my own. And then I would go to the festivals and have a good time and dance a lot. But even during the week, I was dancing every day and sometimes 10 to 15 hours a day. Okay. So like I, I was there to train, I was yeah, there to yeah, dance. Yeah. Um, so in 2013, I came back and I had just been back. So there were several instructors that I met in Europe mm -hmm. were at this festival. Um, Mandela was there, at events was there. Um, at the time I was trying and I was interested in pursuing a partnership with Oscar BA from DC, but he chose not to want to partner because he kind of wanted to do things on his own independently. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is 2013. Yeah. So, the summer of 2013, I actually had a festival. Okay. Which was the first Sky Zomba, and I had brought in, I brought Afro Latin Connection to that festival in DC, and I brought them there because I wanted to share. I wasn't teaching at this point, but I wanted to share with the community the information and the instruction that I was getting when okay. I was in Europe nice. here in the United States, right? So that was the whole goal of the festival, um, was to bring people of really high caliber from Europe here to the US. So I had done that and then I went back with them. And so that was like July 4th weekend. Um, and then after that festival, I, they went to New York and I went to New York with them. And then I went, to, I went back to Europe and I stayed for like two months. I came back and there was the festival in California. And it was also when I first met David uh, Campos from New York, okay. Dave Anguita, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So most of the leads that were there didn't have female partners. Okay. And so I wasn't at all teaching, but many of the lead, many of the guys asked me if I would assist them in their class. Okay. So Eddie asked me first to assist with him in his class. Gita was pregnant at the time, so David asked me to assist with Kim. And then Mandela, I knew from Portugal because uh -huh. he lived in Porto. So I met him before coming to San Francisco. Okay. And so he asked me if I could dance with him. Plus, I was getting privates at that time with Mandela because Mandela uses Kuduro and Afro House and his Samba, and I just loved it. Mm. It was fun. <laughs> so, and he dances differently than most other instructors, right? So, um, so my first experience was helping other instructors at that festival, okay. right? Because I knew how to explain things, mm. I would then just start explaining the females part right. so that they could understand their steps. 
and it wasn't anything formalized. It was just that I knew the guys, I knew the leads, and they asked me if I would help them because they didn't have their partners with them. Um, that's one of the things that I wish would change because from a um, festival standpoint, it's cheaper to bring just the lead over okay, right, right. instead of two people instead right. of two people but the input of a good female of dance instructor of to help with the follows really makes a difference because otherwise the females don't feel like they get anything of out of the class they're just there to teach the guys how to do their movements right so um and I think Vasco was there too that year. I can't remember if that was the first time I taught with Vasco or not. I think, yeah, that was. So I taught with Vasco as well from Paris, right? So, so I ended up that weekend somehow in like 10 or 11 different classes okay. at a time, like that weekend, help, just assisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't planned that way. It was just me being there. And so after that weekend, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm ready to start to yeah, teach. Okay. And uh, Ricardo and Paula from Afro Latin Connection and Pechu and Vanessa were encouraging me to teach by that point. Mm. So when I came back from that festival, that's when I was like, okay, I'm gonna start teaching classes. Mm. So that's when I started opening up my own Kizomba classes, oh. was like November of, 13? Um, I think it was November of 2013, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so please, uh, you know, explain on it you know how was that what was that what was your beginner stage like you know um it was good I mean most of my students initially were my salsa students okay, okay right because they had seen me go to Europe and then come back and then go back and then come back and then go away and then come back and so they were like really <laughs> and so um my dance partner Sion was like are you gonna start teaching Kizomba and I'm like no 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 not yet not yet so literally like through th the like I said 2011 was when I first started 2012. I was like, okay, I really got serious yeah. about it. And then the fall of 2013 um, was when I started, it was like November, uh -huh. right? So, and I just basically would only, only started teaching beginner classes yeah. because I wanted people to dance with mm -hmm. and I wanted to help expand the, um, the scene. And also I really felt strongly about having a woman's perspective in um in the dance because there were lots of leads teaching and not many females teaching but you know the guys would get frustrated because the guys are like well just follow but just follow is not as easy as they say, say. Easier said than done. you have to teach a woman how course, to follow of course right and so and she's somebody to lead yeah exactly you have to teach somebody how to lead you have to teach a woman how to follow so you have to teach her what the signs are and how to feel it and what the hand is and all of that and until we have that understanding we're just kind of flying, flying blind, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely understand that. Yeah. I'll so that's why I started teaching. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I guess I'll, I'll kind of want to ask you the same thing then, you know, maybe for, you know, for some expiring teachers out there, you know, some instructors, um, you know, I guess what advice or words of wisdom could you give them on their journey? Don't stop training. Okay. Always be a student. Always, 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 always be a student. Um, I'm still training. I still have mentors. I still have instructors that I train with. Um, I still try to grab privates when I go right. to festivals. Um, always never be so um, overconfident. Or yeah, like, know okay, it all. yeah, you, you have to continue to be humble and mm. you have to continue to train. Um, I don't care what dance it is in. Right? Like, I still take salsa privates okay. and I've been doing this for 20 years. Okay. So, don't stop training because you always have something new to learn. Don't, um, you know, when you go to a Congress, you take the beginner classes. Okay. Right? And a lot of instructors are like, oh, I don't need to do that. Or they'll sit to the side and watch somebody teach. Get in the classes mm. because you will, you may hear another way to explain something yeah, exactly. that you can then help your students understand something or you'll feel something that you don't even know your students might be doing mm. because all of a sudden you're rotating so right, right, right. one of the things that as a pet peeve of mine is that the instructors don't rotate with the students at a congress it's hard you can't but in your regular classes you should be rotating in with that, your students yeah. because you're not going to feel what your students are doing right. you can, might try to see it and you can explain it but you're not going to feel it and 
the difference between learning on YouTube and the difference between learning with an instructor and in a class is to be able to feel what the heck is sure, going nah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, you know, one is if you're not rotating and you're not feeling what's going on with your students and you're not participating in the class with them, then they may as well be learning online. I believe it. I think it's also, I say it's from a student's perspective, it's a great way to, you know, I guess, feel the proper way to do it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think you definitely, as an instructor, should be rotating. Yeah, you definitely should rotate and you definitely should be taking classes. Don't stop learning. And if you get to a point where you feel like, okay, I've got this, then learn the other side. As in uh, leading or following? Lead, learn, lead, lead or following. Right. Or when you get to that point, then learn the other genres. Like I will use myself as an example. I love uh, Kizomba, mm -hmm. right? And I say all the time, people are now calling it traditional Kizomba and it's driving me nuts. I'm not that old. So anything that is not older than me uh -huh. is not traditional, <laughs> right? right? I'm not, <laughs> I'm sorry. Traditional for me, traditional and Golan dance is tribal. Mm -hmm. okay. It is not Kizomba. Okay. Kizomba's from the 80s. Okay, right. You're trying to tell me that Janet Jackson is traditional R&B? Mm. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. really? Mm -hmm. Madonna's traditional? Like, what is traditional about Madonna? Right. Right? Um, so, because that's when she came around. Mm -hmm. She came up the same time Kizomba was being okay, come up. Okay, okay. Right? Like, put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson's solo album is the same time that Kizomba was being developed. Okay. That's, Michael Jackson's not traditional. Yeah. Right? Prince. He's mm -hmm. not traditional. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I get on that. Um. So when you're, when you're learning right now, for example, I'm learning urban mm -hmm. kids. I don't connect to urban kids the same way that I connect to authentic Kizomba. But as an instructor, I have students who have trained with urban instructors, urban Kizomba instructors, mm -hmm. right? I have students who will take classes or will travel, will go to a festival and they'll be in a workshop. And they need to understand what's the difference. What makes right, this right, right. urban? What makes this right. um, authentic? Exactly. Right? Same thing with bachata. What makes this sensual? What makes this Dominican? Right? What makes this on one? What makes this on two? What makes this Cuban? What makes this New York? Right. Right? So once you have your dance, don't stop your own learning to help you, your students understand their path. Mm -hmm. Right? Because as an instructor, your job is to figure out what is your student's path, and it may not be the same path. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be it's like it because it's well. theirs, right? So then you need to help them go in whatever direction they have. So the more knowledge you have about your style and other styles within the same genre, the better you can lead and the better you can mentor your students yeah. into whatever it is they want. Right? Mm -hmm. I have students that love urban, and they they did not connect to authentic Kizomba the way that right, I did. Right. And that's okay, yeah. right? Because, you know, some people like chocolate ice cream and some people like vanilla. Exactly. I can't imagine why anybody would like <laughs> vanilla over chocolate, <laughs> but that's my own thing, right? right? right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same. Mm. So what I mean by continuing to learn is, okay, fine, you have your thing, still learn it. But now you also have to expand out. Now you have to really like be able to mentor and be able to do that, right? So it's one of the things that I love to do is work with students, but I also like to work and train with instructors on how to teach and how to okay. mentor and how to do things because yeah. otherwise, you know, we all still learn, mm -hmm. right? I have a mentor myself, yeah. you know, with salsa and how to teach and how to run teams. Like we all learn, so it's pay it forward right, and pay right, it behind right. you, yeah, yeah, build yeah. behind you. I understand that. I definitely do. Mm -hmm. I want to, um, I definitely want to hear about, you know, I guess the, you know, the creation of Mamba Room, you know, running a dance school. So, you know, you go, go back to, you, know, you start teaching in November of 13, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, um, how does the idea of owning a dance school, you know, where does that come from? How does that come about? Okay. So, <laughs> the first time I thought about owning a dance studio was in 2004 five or six, okay. right? So I was training um, in salsa. I had my own dance teams. I was renting out studio space. My my partner, Sion Mauricio, and I, we had a dance company called Mesocutis, 
We also, I had Yamashun, which was my women's team. Um, and I would go regularly, I would take our students from DC and I would take them to my mentor in New York City. Can I ask right? who this is? Uh, it's Frankie Martinez. Okay, so enough. Yeah. <laughs> right, so Frankie's Frankie. Yeah. Right. So I've been training um, and, and working with Frankie since I met him in 2002 at the Puerto Rico Salsa Concerts, okay. right? So I would go up, I would train with him, I would come back down, I would go up. Like, for me, he, his particular style of salsa, for me, connects to me, mm -hmm. right? So I would bring students up there, and in, I think it was 2006, his, the studio owner of the studio that Frankie was working at, was considering expanding out and creating franchises. Oh. And so I got into negotiations and I got into conversations with them about it. And part of the conversation really was, okay, well, if I was to own a studio, it's more than just teaching dance, Okay. <laughs> right? There's a whole lot that goes behind the scenes uh, of a studio yeah. that has nothing to do with an actual class on okay. the dance floor, right? It's a business, right? It's a business. And you have to do the marketing, the taxing, the licensing, um, the contracts, mm. the, you know, power bill, the electric bill, the, you know, reef lo the roof leaks, or I don't know, like, uh, there's so many other aspects yes. to a business. And then it's not just about your classes, right? If you, do, I don't, nothing to do with swing or blues, but they, we have swing and blues classes okay, here at nice. the studio, right? And I love them and I can follow them, but you would never see me uh, pretend to teach them because okay. I don't specialize in okay. them, right? So um, I was learning a lot about that from their, from Frankie's manager. Um, so when I would go up and I would bring my teams, I had a, a meeting with him that I just thought we were going to talk about like some basic stuff, and the next thing I knew, it felt like an interview. Oh. I was like, "What am what what is happening?" Um, and then they asked me if I would be interested in expanding out and franchising with them. Okay. And so that was my first time going. Oh my God, wait! I could open up my own business, yeah. and I could do this instead of renting out space. Because mm. at that time, um, Sai and I were actually paying about three thousand dollars a month. Wow in rent space wow. because that's how many hours we were on the floor. Okay. Which is a lot of money. Uh, uh, in anything, of course. <laughs> right? Of course. But imagine we had that many teams and we were on the floor that many hours mm. where we were we were spending about three grand a month. Mm. And we're like, well. Was, um, was, this, was this your full time back then or you still had a? This is when I had had my pacemaker. I had recently gotten my pacemaker. So this was not long after my pacemaker. Um, I wasn't a full time, mm -hmm. but I kind of at one point turned around and realized I was full time. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I like I literally started with 20 minutes in, in for a week and then I would go twice a week and then three days a week. And then I built up to that and I turned around and I realized that I was on the floor like 40 to 50 hours a week. Wow. And I was like, holy smokes, yeah. right? But then in, in, in between that, I would have episodes. So I was still passing out and I was okay, still blacking out. Okay. So when I did that, Sai would take over because mm. we worked as a team. I so when you. I needed my time off, if I wasn't on the floor, he was on the floor, okay. right? So so it was still kind of like I was learning to balance my, my medical condition right. with my passion for dancing, with my love for teaching. Because when I used to do martial arts, I also used to teach martial arts, okay. right? So I've always been a, what I consider giving back. Like mm -hmm. I always want to teach behind me. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So when I was having those conversations with them, I was looking, looking for spaces and I found a couple of spaces in DC that we were going to talk about expanding into. And then, um, the studio owner decided to actually close empire mm -hmm. because she got pregnant with twins. And she said, studio, kids, I'm going to be with my family. So she closed Empire. Frankie moved to another studio. And I decided to kind of put that on hold. Okay. And then after that, I just kind of was teaching. And then I think it was like 2010, 2011, I started traveling a lot. And I started going to different studios. And because of my time with my, the studio at Empire, and because of the t stuff that I was doing back home with our teams and renting and looking at the management of the different studios where I was renting and how to like 
manage that and team schedules and somehow like all that other part of it, I ended up doing what one of my friends calls studio rescue, okay. <laughs> where I would go in and I would help um, counsel behind the scenes the owners of different studios in how to build a program, how okay. to develop instructors, what's their best use of their space, how to try to use their space for like business meetings or other mm, things okay, when yeah, yeah, they yeah. weren't running during the during the day because most of dance classes are in the evening. Right. So to how find to a like way to utilize it a bit. How to yeah, find a way to utilize it because dance companies or dance studios are universally known as what we call money pits, right? Ah. So it's they're uh, very expensive because they're wide spaces, so it takes a lot of energy to heat or to right. cool. Um, <laughs> and d dancers don't pay a lot. F ballroom studios ha are more successful because they're more structured uh -huh. in the way of um, the pricing. But like a salsa class, most people aren't paying more than 10 or $15 for a class, right? right? Ballroom lessons can go up to you know 150 to 250 dollars an hour, okay. where a salsa private is going to charge you like anywhere between 50 to depending on the instructor. Yeah, like depending on the instructor. It, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. But like when I first moved here five years ago, or no, four years ago, I was making 120 traveling. Okay. 100 to 120 traveling. Um, and then I would come here and it would be like $65, okay. right? And so you saying Virginia or? Mm -hmm. okay. No, Norfolk. Oh, okay. DC, yeah, yeah. Northern Virginia. Uh, I was making 100, oh, okay, 120 okay, an okay, hour. Okay. Right? So it just depends on your, um, location, yeah. your location, right? How many privates can you book? How does that work? Independently, I was making that on my own. As a studio owner, we need that to pay for the space, yeah. right? So you don't make as much as a salsa instructor teaching at a studio. Mm. So it's figuring out how to balance that, how to balance the bills, how to pay the staff, right. and you, you know. So um, I was kind of doing that while I was traveling and learning about different programs and also, you know, consulting and, and mentoring and that kind of stuff and also developing different instructors. And then I started traveling for Kizomba. Mm -hmm. And so then I spent more time in Europe right. and uh, coming back. So then my, my classes in D.C. slowed down quite a bit because I was really gone half the time. Um, so Cy pretty much took over most of the time full time. And then I would show up for like a couple of months and then I'd peace out for a couple of months. And he'd be like, oh. and I'm like, sorry, I have to go train. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so the whole time I always kind of wanted to eventually own a studio. Okay. As a dancer, um, the joy of teaching dance is really what fuels me. Okay. I actually am, you know, I love to dance, and then I love to teach, and then I love to perform. Okay. I don't really love to perform. A lot of dancers love to perform, love to dance, or love to dance, love to perform, and then, oh yeah, they teach. I'm the opposite. Mm -hmm. I love to dance and I love to share, so I want to teach. Okay. I perform because I had to teach choreography because I like to create choreography. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, performing was never like the uh, ultimate goal. Uh -huh. um, so while I was traveling, I'm getting older, and I am realizing I want to kind of settle down and you know have a family uh -huh. and yeah. you know find a place where I want to. And that meant someplace by the beach okay. because me and the beach have a long um, spiritual connection yeah. of just it. It's in me like yeah. me. Right. So. <laughs> so Tracy contacted me while I was in Europe and said, hey, um, you know, our my partners are no longer here. And I'm wondering if you're interested in helping out and doing some instructor training because I need you know, some higher level classes. And um, her instructor used to come to DC and train with my partner and I. Okay. And so he would come up for like three years. Every weekend they would drive from Norfolk to DC mm. every year, uh, every weekend, every Sunday for like three years. And, I'm, and I now know what that drive is like back and forth. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my yes. goodness. Yeah. Right, every weekend for three years. That is no joke. That is no joke. And he used to get really frustrated because people would come late or people would complain about uh -huh. the drive. And he'd be like, 
right? And I'm like, yeah, you talk to him. You can't right. say nothing. You yeah. don't get you don't get to complain about this. You know, yeah. he's driving from Virginia Beach, mm. from Norfolk. Yeah. Um, and he had his kid with him, him and his wife. They would come together. Um, so I talked. So I was familiar with Tracy and familiar with the studio. So I started coming down. And then she had talked to me about her interest in selling the space and the studio. And I was like, mm. Excuse me, right here or? Not this uh, space, okay, okay. the old space, I'm which was right like here. half the size mm, of this space. Okay. See, I, I, don't, I don't even know that old space. Yeah, here. the old space is like right around the corner. If oh, you wow. saw it, you'd be like, seriously? And I'd be like, yeah, that's it. Wow. Literally, it's like half the size of this main room. Wow. And this, this is a very little. spacious place, seriously. Yeah, this well, this main this room is just under three thousand square feet. Okay. The whole building itself is sixty six hundred square feet. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's a very nice. You got a couple rooms. Yeah, it's very nice. You have a kitchen too, right? Yeah, we yeah. have a kitchen. We have our um, our uh, restaurant license, mm -hmm, yeah. so we sell food and we yeah. do catering, and we have our ABC license, so yeah. we do beer and wine. Mm -hmm. Part of that was my experience working with other studios. Okay. So when Tracy and I talked about me partnering. We were like, okay, this small space is not going to bring us in enough money okay. to be able to support both of us. Right. It's not going to happen. So we needed to expand. So then it was, okay, well, why don't we expand? There was a space right next to hers that would have given her a second room. And the goal initially was she was going to expand, I was going to help out. And then maybe in a year and a half to two years, I would come down and we could partner. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> Right. Um, and but Tracy and I got along really well. We called it we were like, let's I called it dating. Like, you know, like when you date, you don't really know somebody. You kind of might think they're interesting. You right. might get along, but you don't really know yet. Not yet right. right. So that's pretty much what we did. And we got along really well. We think very similarly, like she has all of the skills and sets and um, abilities that I don't have. Okay. Um, one of my weaknesses is marketing. Okay. I'm not a big, yay, look at me person. Like, mm -hmm. it's not my thing. Um, Tracy is an amazing marketer nice. and um, web designer and graphic designer, and she does all our flyers. She does our our calendar. She does our developer. Mm -hmm. and, like, she just, that is Tracy, That's and awesome. she is phenomenal That's at awesome. it she's very good at it so really when we partnered I gave her the dance background uh -huh. and okay, she right. gave me the marketing and business background sure and so for us it was a great pairing um, and so we talked about that and we met with the landlord and we were supposed to just open up a small space next door to theirs and then this was like in August of 2015 <laughs> <laughs> and then, or it's like July, I think, July or August of 2015. And we sat down with the landlord and he's like, well, I have this building over there. And we looked at each other and we came in and that was it. We were like two kids at Christmas. We were like, oh my God, we could put this here. We could put that here. We yeah. could do this. And then we looked at each other. We were like, are we going to do this? Mm. And we were like, are we going to partner? Am I moving here? Hey. Because here has a beach. Hey. Right? And Leroy was like, look, there's a beach. Hey. You can move to the beach. Cause they know that that's what gets me right. to go. Cause I was about to move to Portugal. I was wow. going to move to Porto and live on the beach. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, they're like, but there's a beach here and you could own a studio. And I'm like, oh my God, okay. And so that's what happened. We opened up this space and that was, uh, August of 2015, we decided to do it. And then April, the end of April 2016 is when we opened this space okay. up. So part of our design was knowing that as much as I love dance, uh -huh. dance doesn't pay all of the bills, okay. right? right. <laughs> as much as we love it too, yeah. it not a space this size. So we, we, really we decorated it, we created it, as an event venue for cultural events, nice. okay, yeah, for yeah. weddings, for quinceañeras, because it's a family business, it, okay, right? Okay. So Tracy and Dorian have a beautiful daughter. We're like, we want a space for her to have her quinceañera, her yeah. sweet 15, right? 
uh, we wanted a place for me to be able to do festivals. Like I'm going to redo the summit here and it's going to be in May of 2020. I'm going to bring it back. Um, we wanted a place where we could do concerts. Yeah. We wanted a place where we could do weddings and anniversaries and Christmas parties. So when we created the space, our main ballroom has all of those capabilities. Mm -hmm. And then we also have another practice room. We also have another private lesson room. And then we have our office and our lounge area where we sell shoes and right. the whole thing. Yeah. So we have like a mambo room line. Yeah. So all of those pieces help pay from the business perspective, the whole okay. thing, That's right? Awesome. So idea. it can't just be classic, a dance right? studio. Right, right, right. It, because the dance studio doesn't, it doesn't cover the space. I understand. And that's, that's, that's good. Um, that's just good business, you know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, it was a different shift though, because, you know, going from teaching individually and just doing my own thing to now having to do that flip of, okay, now I have to run this like a business. Yeah. Right? It's, it's a different. very different mind shift. It is. You just go from a dancer to a businesswoman, right? Yeah. A business owner. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. you kind of are running your own business when you're teaching independently yeah. because you're, you know, doing your own contracts, finding your own gigs, you're, you know, performing and you're traveling and you're running your teams and you're making sure that your budget and all that stuff is, is consistent and, you know, can pay your bills. But it's very different when you have a space and now you have a staff. So you're uh -huh. paying instructors, you're paying yeah. front desk people, you're paying for licensing. Like, you know, I talk about the fact that we had to have a law changed to be able to be in this building so that we could sell beer and wine at a wedding. Okay. Like it was. You had a law change. That's yeah. impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was to create what we created. Um, was not like it was just not like an easy task and mm. people were like oh you should do this and you should and we were like yes we should <laughs> and you know we we worked really hard um to make it happen yeah. you know and we still are we're still growing we're yeah. still growing the space we still have renovations that we want to do um you know and it's it's a process right yeah. it's just like every you know couple of months we'll add a little bit of this and every couple of months we try to add a little bit of that and we have our long-term goals yeah um, what has it been, so, uh, four years now, or three and a half? Um, it's been three and a half years. Three and a, okay. Yeah, so because enough. I had the last summit in April, in the beginning of April 2016, okay. the end of the week, uh, the end of the, the, the month, month three uh, weeks later, we opened this space. Okay, okay, so now. <laughs> yeah. I want to um, I wanna ask you this thing, you know, kind of like what I was asking really, you know, maybe for someone else who is an inspiring, you know, dance studio owner, you know, mm -hmm. um, I guess what words of wisdom can you give them? Um, hmm. Be prepared. Okay. For the work or what would you what? Be prepared for the work, but also be prepared for the mind shift. You have to be ready for the mind shift. Like I said, it's very different. You know, like there is a mind shift when you're a dancer and you love the dance and you really get very good at it and you enjoy it so much and then you teach. Mm -hmm. um, when you shift from a dancer to a teacher, there are things that come with that. Right. There is expectations, there's criticism, there is um, a lot of politics that people don't understand or don't know about behind the scenes, okay. right? right? There is, um, when you're a dancer, everyone's your bestie uh -huh. because all you're there is to dance and right, everybody right, else right. is there to dance too. Right, right, right. Now all of a sudden when you become a dance instructor, it becomes also partly a business. Mm. And so other people who um, may not think that you're qualified or may not, you know, other people are going to have opinions about whether you should or should not be teaching, uh -huh. right? Or how you are teaching or not right, teaching, right, right. right? So there is a shift that happens from Te dancing socially and teaching. Also, the shift is a personal one. All of a sudden, you go out dancing because you want to dance, right? It's your stress relief, exactly. it's your fun, it's your place to hang out with your friends. Now it changes from just because you want to to an obligation. Right. Because you can't just not show up to a Monday class because you're tired. Yeah. Right? You can have a bad day and still have to be giving and nurturing to your students. So. It is a dynamic change, like, and that is something that anybody who goes from a dancer to a teacher, that's usually the hardest part. Okay. It's never the actual material. 
Uh -huh. It is literally that dynamic change and not getting burnt out right. because you have to still have this love and passion for it. And that shift between becoming a dancer to a business as an instructor can easily create burnout okay. and can easily yeah. create you from forgetting why you do it in the first place because now it's no longer just when you want to do it, but now there's an obligation behind right. it, right? There is an additional shift when you become an advanced instructor to a team director uh -huh. and then from a team director to a studio owner and sometimes it's not even in that order right right yeah honestly, yeah. yeah some you know the order can be all exactly. whatever it is right but each time you go to a new um hat or right, a right, new right. dynamic right. within the dance itself it creates a new growth and it also creates a new responsibilities yeah. and it creates a new shift. And so I am a very different person now than I was when I first course, opened this of studio course, of course. because I have learned so much and I understand so many more things go into certain things. And um, you know, a friend of mine and I were talking about it recently and it is literally like you go to high school, you go to college, you go to grad school and then you go to the real world, okay. right? Every time you go back, you're not quite the same. Of course. When you go to college and you get together with friends from high school that didn't leave high school, mm -hmm. you're different. Yeah. They might be doing the same thing even two years later, but you're different. Yeah. And then you go to grad school and you, you get a different education, yeah. you get a different level of understanding, you get a different level of thinking, and you go back to see your college mm -hmm friends that you were doing frat parties with or whatever and yes it's fun but you're different. different each time you go up the ladder you have to prepare yourself for a mind shift mm -hmm. you have to prepare you because if you don't you it is harder to be successful right, right, right. if you don't you're no longer growing with your dynamics right. you're not growing Just with stagnant. your like you know first you're like here then you're here then you're here you have to be able to hold more mm -hmm. you have more responsibilities like I have employees that have health benefits now okay. right yeah. like before I didn't even have health benefits for myself okay. right though that's different when you realize that someone else is paying their bills based off of the money that you need to pay them yeah that it changes things that, that, that is uh that's intense right so it's like most people don't think about that but it's a small business mm. Right, so you still have all the dynamics, and yet you still have to make it fun. You still have to make it about dance. You still have to make it about family. You still have to make it about healing. Yeah. You still have to, so as you grow out, sometimes people lose the perspective of why it all started mm -hmm. and where that passion was. Okay. And it's important to remember that as you grow away from it, uh -huh. if that makes yeah, any no, sense. Uh, let me ask you this real quick. Um, I, I'm, I would be curious to hear, you know, um, I guess kind of like two-part question. One, you know, I guess what was the most difficult time period for you? Was it that first year owning the studio? And and two, um, you know, I guess, you know, what could you have done differently? What did you learn from it you know, that, that someone else can get, gain, gain okay. knowledge from? Never have a festival and open the studio in the same month. Okay, so no. Never. So having a festival open Wait. a grand opening? Never. <laughs> Um, and expand on that. Like, why, okay. Why? So, it's too much going on. It's too like much it? going on. Okay. I had the summit, and the summit grew from the Sky Zomba, right? So it was the first festival in DC, right? First one was 2013. We had 2014, 2015, 2016. 2016, I brought Eduardo Paim the first time to the United States ever, which nice. meant um, visas. Oh, okay. um, I had the Fab Four, which is Miguel, Susana, Paulo, and Lana mm -hmm. from Portugal, okay. Jamba and Adori. Plus, we brought Renata, who is the, the um, creator of Brazilian Zouk. She came to do a history and talk about Brazilian Zouk. Wow. And we had Paim, That's right? Impressive. So, yeah. And I guess you were managing all of this at once? Or I was trying to manage Ooh, all of this lot. at once. That's a lot. At the same time, I'm driving down here, meeting with the city council, trying okay. to have laws changed oh so that goodness. we could open up, going over, picking out floors, going over budgeting, going over loans, yeah. um, breaking down walls, doing renovations, 
um, moving because I'm living in DC, but okay. I'm living here, but I've got my festival there, but I've got to try to open a studio here. And during that time frame, at the same time, my pacemaker went out. Hey, you got a lot on your plate. <laughs> so I'm doing that and my health was failing. Um, the summit, there were lots of people who had tons of opinions about how I should be doing things. At the same time, didn't really realize what I was trying to open here uh -huh. and what I was trying to build here. So I'm having health issues. I'm trying to have a festival. Um, and some of my team members, um, unfortunately, fell off because of their own lives. And so part of that is now that um, one of the things is, is that as well intended as some people are, sometimes, um, you know, people are like, oh, you, sh you need to delegate. You can't do everything yourself. And that's true. But because it's your baby, it's more. Right. No one's going to if follow through it. with okay. it the same way you will, right? right of course. Right? Yeah. So I made the mistake of leaving certain things to other people mm. who had committed to those things, and then they were not able to follow through. Hey. Based on life things, nothing that they did intentionally, but I was not at a point where I could pick it up because I also was opening a 6,600-square-foot right. studio. Yeah, so much I was moving. Way. And I'm trying to get visas and bring people and market and try to do both in two different cities. <laughs> Don't ever do it. Um, so that, for me, that time frame was the hardest because um, it put a lot of stress of and it put a lot of pressure on my friendships. Yeah. It put a lot of pressure and stress on myself. And your health too. And my health. And, um, you know, but both had to happen. Um, the space of opening the studio, that happened, it wasn't supposed to happen during the same time. Because initially, remember, I was thinking, oh, well, we'll open it a year and a half out. Uh -huh. And then the space was available. Okay. And at the rate that we were getting at the time with our landlord, at, like going over the numbers, it made no sense to not take it. Okay. Right. So then the opportunity comes in front of you and you say, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. And yeah. we're like, of course we're going to do it because literally it was financially the smartest thing to do. Okay. And building the studio is something that I've wanted to do for at that point over a decade. Uh -huh. Right. And I'm going to move on the beach. So you're talking about a dream that I've had for most of my life, not you know, as a kid, I wanted to own a studio. Yeah. Is that like, you know what I mean? I've always wanted to dance. I've always danced. So as a dancer, a studio is kind of like the, your graduate degree, your like thing that you do, right? Um, at least it was always for me. Mm -hmm. And it, like I said, really first came into play in the early 2000s. I was like, oh, I could do this. This is possible. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. And then, you know, I had to figure out another way to do it. So for this opportunity to come up, it was something that I didn't want to say no to. Of course, I understand. Right? Because this is, you know, this my life. Nice oh, okay, yeah. Right? So, uh, um, so I had to take it. Yeah. And it had, based on, you know, the availability, based on the landlord, based on the finances, we needed to do what we needed to do. Um, so that came about in the partnership with Tracy. The timing for the studio, unfortunately, was not... Um, the best Primary, right? right, it wasn't prime. <laughs> it was not the best. Okay, right, right, right. Um, especially with the summit mm -hmm. and what the summit entailed. And, um, so be, you know, I'm only one person, right? right so right. I, was, I was really very split. Yeah. And to do both within a matter of weeks, um, it, it took a huge toll, like I said, on some friendships, and it took a huge toll on um, my health, and it took a huge toll. I think both things suffered do you okay, know because because everything because it was just all at once right yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't you can only give so much exactly. you only have so much energy right. you only have so much you can do as much as you try to give a hundred percent to both projects there is literally only so many hours in the day right. and then with my health going in and out it was just difficult yeah. like right I'm only one person um, and people definitely understood on both sides but that was the hardest thing. So the reason that the summit got put 
on a shelf was because I needed to make sure that I wasn't going to make that mistake again. Okay. I needed to make sure that the studio was solid, right. that things were good, and that um, you know we were building from the ground up here with the studio and I wasn't trying to overstretch myself and I wasn't trying to do right, too much at right, one right. time, right? Mm. So that was the whole point. And so that's why I did the summit every year and then I haven't done it since 2016 okay. because, and people are like, well, where did you go? Because before 2016 um, and before opening the studio, I was traveling, I was teaching at Congresses, I was performing. Um, more people knew me in the Kizomba scene. I was going back and forth to Europe. Uh -huh. I was doing trips. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, okay, you held the summit. It was really good. You were supposed to capitalize off of that momentum and it would have been bigger. Uh -huh. And instead, I didn't do it. Okay. And everyone was like, what happened to Kianda? Like, where did she go? <laughs> and there are people now that have been dancing for two or three years who don't know me. Uh -huh. Right? And at that time, I was a really um, known instructor uh -huh. and known um, person within the community. I mean, I had my own festival, I traveled a lot, yeah. I danced a lot, I taught a lot, you know, I was around. Um, and now everyone's like, what happened to you? Mm. <laughs> and so this year I was able to go to Angola for the first yeah. time in February. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start traveling and I'm going to start doing my thing. So um, I was able to um, speak with Eduardo Paim, and Eduardo Paim is coming back to the summit. Hey, hey, hey. Um, I was able to work out a contract with Pechu, so Pechu is coming, that's and he's going to awesome. do an instructor training course as oh, well, man, that's awesome. which I'm excited about. So that's the week before the summit. Ah. So you can come during the week and do the summit, and then, I mean, come during the week, do the instructor right, training right. course, and then for that weekend, do so the enough. summit. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, and so, yeah, so that's really, you know, when you our first developing and first doing a studio it, it's a lot and it's things that you don't even think about oh, right like, there's problems you you can't you, like, you can't, you can't you know everything right right it's like when you it's like trying to build a house right right you, you know can't. you're trying to build a house and all of a sudden like for example um we couldn't get our abc license unless we had a sprinkler system in oh, right really? because in in a for one of the zoning, they, if you have an ABC license, they also zone you as a club. Okay. Okay. So for uh, security reasons and for safety reasons, right, you, you hear, heard about different clubs where because something got fire. set on fire uh -huh. and then everyone got trapped and there was no sprinkler system. I've heard about that, yeah. And because if there's a lot of alcohol, people who are inebriated don't always, you know, act exactly. appropriately, which can cause a fire in the first place, right? Now at a dance studio, we're not really drinking that much. No one's drinking hard alcohol, but it's still part of exactly. the safety right, requirements, right, right. right? So we're like, okay. So we put in a sprinkler system, but in that process, the testing for the water pressure for the city line was low. So then we actually had to put in a fire hydrant outside, like a block over, so that we weren't tapping into a different line. Okay. That is not an expense that we really exactly. thought of. Like, who's going to think that exactly. we're going to have to put a fire hydrant to put a sprinkler system in to get an ABC license? Right. When all we <laughs> right. want to sell is beer and wine right. on a Friday That's night wild. once a week. Yeah. <laughs> Extra incurred costs. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it literally is like a domino effect it of is. that. That's crazy. And so that's, you know, what was going on. Mm. Um, so it's a lot of different pieces at the same time. It is. Yeah. As a, as kind of suppressed, you know, kind of rolling with the punches, though, right? Yeah, you have to be able to roll with the punches. Adapt. You have Valuable. to be, you have to think on your feet right. very quickly. <laughs> and um, for me, I had to take a lot of walks on the beach. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Yeah, I, know. I wanna, um, I wanna, I wanna kind of switch it up on you. You know, okay. I wanna hear about. You know, I believe you have a new clothing line. Is that correct? I'm working on working one. On, working on, working on. Yeah. Me. So I don't have it yet, but mm -hmm. I'm working on it. It's in progress. So um, I, um, you know, through my exploration with Kizomba and Semba, I have fallen in love with the Angolan community and culture. Yeah. Um, and part of the things that I love and I have found out that I've loved is African fashion. Okay. And their fabrics and the prints and the designs. So while I was in Angola, um, I purchased a ton <laughs> of fabrics. Yeah. And I am working with a seamstress here in Norfolk, and we're creating a line called It's Kianda. Hey. And it literally is a 
fusion between African fashion and Western fashion. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I love it, mm -hmm. and I, you know, have made, I've had made, I've designed a couple of pieces, nice. and my seamstress, she's, you know, sewn them together, and they're they're a ton of fun, and they're great, and I love them. Hey. Um, yeah, it's just I. It, it's part of the culture that I enjoy, mm -hmm. and it's bright and happy hey, and hey, fun, hey. and yeah. you know. Um, and it's part of my like you know designing costumes yeah. and trying to create some of that stuff over the years for the dancing and so now i'm just doing it for everyday life okay. <laughs> as well I, I think um you know hearing it now i think I, I see it as um you know another testament to like your business prowess you know always trying something <laughs> different right yeah seriously. always trying to grow right. yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah very impressive thank you right. yeah, seriously <laughs> Thanks. um speaking on this you know i want to tell talk to me about um I guess the meaning of your name, you know, Kianda. What is? How did that come about? Where did you get that from? Um, so the line is called It's Kianda okay. because my the person that I'm working with, her name is Itzy, okay, and she is from Germany, uh -huh. and so and we're using my name Kianda, so It's Kianda okay. as together. Um, Kianda is a very special name for me. Um, it was given to me by my Astro hey. and. Um, very simplistically, because it does have a lot of different meanings to different people, it means like queen of the oceans, but it also is a specific area of, in Angola, off of Luanda, there's an island and there's a beach um, that they do a ceremony every year to Kianda to the oceans. Uh -huh. And you know, the, um, the oceans is like the giver of life. Mm -hmm. And um, so, when I was with Pechu in February, we went, um, we had a private ceremony, we went to the ocean, and I went in and we did the whole ceremony, it was very cool. That's awesome. And um, yeah, it was great. And so, um, for me, the ocean is um, clarity and peace and calming, and it is where I feel the most at home. Okay. Right? Yeah. And if I'm not by the ocean, I want to be by a river, I want to be by a body of water, like I just, me and water, I'm connected to water and it needs to be around me. Yeah. When I'm not, I get a little cranky. Yeah. <laughs> and when I am, everyone's like, wow, you're so peaceful, you're okay. so like chill. And I'm like, that's because I live at the beach. When hey. I don't, I don't, I'm not that way. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I need like a water you know, fountain or water, something around me, and then I'm happier, uh -huh. right? The, just water soothes me very, I, I'll even like watch when a, in a water fountain, you know, when the water goes up, yeah. I'll even like hang out and just watch that. Like, okay. you know, that to me, just peaceful. I, understand. I don't know. Yeah, I understand. So, um, and I've always been that way as a kid. I've always been connected to the water. I've always loved to swim. I've always felt you know, like The Little Mermaid was my favorite movie. Okay. Like there's always a part of me that has always felt incredibly connected and calm and grounded um, from the ocean. Okay. And so when, um, you know, when Petshu gave me the nickname, it stuck with me because one of the reasons he gave it to me is while I was in Portugal, I always wanted to be on the beach. I would dance on the beach, I'd practice on the beach, I would teach on the beach. I was one of the first, I think I was the first um, instructor to teach Kizomba in a pool. Okay. And it was in Seattle and they were like, you want to do what? And I'm like, no, listen, really did it. Yeah. And I did it one year at the Baltimore Salsa Congress as well. Um, you know, when you are teaching on the beach, your feet connect to the earth and to the sand differently than they do on a dance floor. Yeah, definitely, right? of course. It's harder, mm. but it also like really you push into the sand and you really can f connect and yeah. feel grounded. And then also you can see visually where your weight is. Like if your weight's True. here or there, you're gonna see it just based on how the sand's yeah. gonna move underneath you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the same thing when you actually go into the water, when you're dancing and you can feel it, it slows you down. So when we talked earlier about being kind of on the end of that beat, you get there, but you just get there. And it's because the um, the presence of the water acts like almost like an ankle weight, right? Yeah, uh -huh. And right, it slows right, right. you down. Mm. So when you think about walking in a pool, you don't, you can't run. Exactly. You have to like shuffle, and you go through it, and it's like, uh, uh, right? That feeling 
is the feeling of kizomba. Uh -huh. And when you learn how to do that in the water, then you have an understanding of how to translate that to the floor. Uh -huh. yeah. And then you're dancing and connecting to another human being very differently. Yeah. Um, and you know, like, I think we talked about it. Did you do the class with me on the beach? Yeah, I've done it one time, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and it, it changes things. Definitely. It changes how you walk. It, change, it, it just, it, it, it makes it to me more connected. Mm -hmm. um, and the ocean, you know, is, it just connects all of us. It doesn't matter what continent you live on. It doesn't matter what, where you're at. Like, every continent has an ocean, uh -huh. right? right? And so it's all, to me, one body of water they all have different names but they're all connected right. and, and to me that's kind of one of the things that connects us all together mm -hmm. um, so I, I love the ocean and I like I said to me it's home yeah so I can be anywhere in the world and be at an ocean and I'm home <laughs> right yeah does not matter doesn't matter it doesn't matter mm -hmm. yeah I'm home hey, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, I really want to I guess at this point I really want to thank you Keon, you know, oh, for taking time to talk to me, I really, really do appreciate it. Oh, of course. We've been trying to get this together for a oh, while for now, a while. but my, oh, yeah. yeah, my schedule. It's, so I'm um, welcome back. Oh, I'm excited yeah, yeah. that you're course, 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 your course, local course. again. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I was so surprised when I saw you. I was like, wait, what? Hey, 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 so yeah, yeah, I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to, um, you know, I guess, let me ask you this, you know, uh, sure. what are some of, you know, the upcoming events, you know, what do you have going on? So I talked about the summit. Right. And that's, uh, May um, it is May 1st through 4th, okay. 2020. Sure it's going to be here in Norfolk, Virginia. Sure um, the hotel is going to be the Marriott, which is uh, only a couple of miles away. We'll have a shuttle to the studio, nice. but all of the classes and all the events and all the parties and everything will be here, um, which is going to be nice because now I have my own space. Exactly, I have my yeah. own staff. Right. I have like, it's just going to be here. It's, it's going to be a home. It's going to be my event. Yeah. Um, it is smaller intentionally than a lot of other larger festivals so it literally we are limiting full passes to 150 people and it will be 75 leads and 75 follows the goal is to try to get um, so it's not men or women it's are you leading or are you following okay right okay. that's a different thing um, and the goal is to, so that a lot of festivals are what we consider follow heavy oh. right there's a lot more follows than leads and it very is, it's, um, you know, when I created the summit and when the, when the community and my team created the summit, the goal was, has always been education mm -hmm. and coming together and with understanding. And so that's why it was never just like, oh, a congress or a festival. It's always been a summit. Okay. Um, it, like I said, initially started off as Sky Zomba and that changed into the summit because the, the, as the idea formed and grew, it expanded and became more. And um, that's why we also do the instructor training mm. the week before. Okay, okay. Um, so it really is, we're going to have Eduardo Payin back, nice. which will be his first time back hey. since the summit last time. And um, Petshu, it'll be hey. the first time Petshu and Payin are together and having the conversations and the uh, musicology that they're going to be doing, which I'm very excited about. So it'll be specific to the summit. And also it has a, um, it, it really is educationally focused, okay. right? Yeah. So it'll be history, it'll be the music, it'll be how and when and why. Um, there'll be food, um, which I love. Pedju says he's going to cook, hey. but I keep explaining to him he's not going to cook for 150 people. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't have that facility. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so he'll probably cook during the instructor training course, okay. which will be a smaller group. Um, so if he's insisting on cooking for that group, and I said, that's fine. He that's can cool. cook for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's an amazing cook. Hey. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so that whole thing will be the May 1st through 4th unless you're coming for the instructor cleaning course, okay. which will be that Monday before that, okay. right? So I think it's like uh, April right. something. I don't remember right. the date off the top. But um, so that's the biggest event that's happening. And then um, for here in Norfolk, that's it for Kizomba. Um, we do have our anniversary party for the Mamba Room coming up in uh, Halloween weekend. Hey. And we are doing a fundraiser. So my partner, Tracy, her husband, I don't know if you've noticed, seen it on Facebook, but he was diagnosed in April with multiple myeloma, okay. which is a very aggressive cancer. 
Um, so we're doing a big fundraiser right. for him. That's how Mr. Dorian, right? Yeah, this yeah. is Dorian, yeah. This is the, those Dancing for Dorian signs yeah, that you yeah. see all over the place here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so he is, um, he's at Duke University now okay. under treatment for multiple myeloma, and he's uh, receiving chemo. So can we hold that up for the camera? Sure. Yeah, we definitely should do that. There you go. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Just so long, I guess we would see this. Video. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you just uh, fundraisers for them, correct? Yeah. Um, so we've been doing um, classes here at the studio once a month, and you'll see them called Dancing for Dorian, so yeah. all the proceeds. There's been different instructors um, who have been donating their time, DJs. They'll donate their time so that all of the money raised from those different events are going to Dorian. Right. And then we also have been doing match events. Okay. So if you're interested, you can go onto my Facebook page, which is Tanya Kianda. Um, or you can also go into the Mamba Room and you'll see information about how to see if you could be a bone marrow match. Okay. Um, one of the things that is, um, which some of the things that I didn't know that I thought was really surprising, is if you are Hispanic, you only have about a 46% chance of finding a match. Wow. If you don't get a match, you don't make it. Okay. If you are African American, you have only a 23 percent chance of finding a match okay. and literally all it is is a cheek swab and 75 percent of the time all they need is your blood okay so it's like donating blood uh -huh. they're looking for more than that they're looking for specific genetic markers um, that would match up and if you have that match, they're looking for the cells inside your blood that stimulate new stem cell growth and mm. new bone marrow growth. Okay. So what they, they do is they use those cells to then create new bone marrow because as the blood goes through the body, that's one of the things that helps feed and grow mm. your bone marrow. Okay. So a lot of people think that they have to kind of drill into the bone and get a sample and grow that, but actually they can now grow it from... 75% of the time they can grow it from your blood. Okay, so enough. So it's just like going and giving blood. So it's okay. really simple, really easy to do. And um, they need as many um, ethnically diverse people as possible so they bring up these numbers. Because okay. I mean, to, to only have a match 23% of the time for African American really? is like... Less than a quarter. Yeah. That means everyone else passes. They die. Yeah, okay. Because they didn't get a match. Right. It's, it's insane. That is when all it is is a cheek swab and some blood. Okay. I definitely so, understand that. Yeah, so we, this is something that I'm only learning now uh -huh. because of what's been going on with Dorian. Um, so we've been doing the fundraisers and Be a Match program. You can also go online and just say Be a Match, and it'll take you right to a website. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. so no. Yeah, and you can text a number, and they can send a kit to your house. Okay. So if That's you're interested... Awesome. Come to my Facebook, go to the Mamba Room, go to Be The Match, any of the sort. If you are interested in Kizomba, yeah. please come to the summit. Yeah. Um, once tickets go on sale, which are going to be soon, it will sell out quickly. I believe quickly. it. Yeah. Especially, yeah. 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 Um, so I think you offer classes. Best way to see class schedule or just go online? Um, yeah, best way to see class schedule. We offer classes six days a week. Yes. The Sundays we do team practices okay. and rehearsals. Um, but Kizomba is on Wednesdays at 8 o'clock. Sure um, so we have Salsa on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, starting at 7.30 for beginners or advanced, depending on your level. Um, it's really simple. The level system is level 1, 2, and 3 for beginner, mm -hmm. 4, 5, 6 for intermediate, 7, 8, and 9 for advanced. Okay. Right? So, and then we have bachata on Thursdays and on Fridays. Yeah. And then we have every Friday night, we have a social. It's only 10 bucks to okay. get in. Yeah. And then they do um, a beginner class from 9 to 10. And then open dancing from 10 until 1 a.m. Okay. And then every Saturday, we have a different genre crash course, which oh, okay. is like a three-hour class, which is what we did today, exactly. the Kizoma, yeah, Kizoma class. Kizoma crash course. Mm-hmm. I know that we said that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's that. every Saturday we have a different one. Okay, so awesome. like one week it's salsa, one week it's bachata, one week it's kizomba, awesome. then sometimes it's swing or rueda or blues or Afro Cuban that's or really cool. you know, whatever yeah. whatever we come up uh -huh. with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, real, real quick, how can sure. how can people get in contact with you? What's the, what's the best way to reach out to you? The best way to reach out to me is on Facebook. Okay. It's under Tanya Kianda. Um or you can room, right? call the studio or look me up online at the Mamba Room. 
um, in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, those are the best ways to get in That's touch with me. So when I post it, I'll put all the links. I'll yeah. put it in okay. the description. I guess. Yeah, great, yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, like I said, like I said, Kiana, thank you so much. Thank I thoroughly you. enjoyed it. Me too. Hey, thanks Yay. for doing it. For this episode two of your podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey. 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 Hey everyone, uh, if you made it this far to all the way to the end of the video, I want to thank you so much. Um, my overall goal with making these interviews and these episodes is uh, to give a voice to dancers, you know, to give them a platform to speak their story. So uh, if this is of value to anyone, then that, that means the world to me. Um, my overall goal is to give value to the dance community. So, if you find no value in this, and I, I urge you to please let me know where I can improve on. Um, I, I truly want to, you know, just uh, give value and content to, to the dance community. Um, so, please let me know how I can improve, where I'm messing up, because to be 100% honest with you, um, you know, I'm learning along the way as I do this. I, I truly am. So um, to be able to interact with you know the dance community, it means the world to me because it it gives me feedback and it lets me know you know what I'm doing right, where I can improve upon, um, you know what I'm doing wrong, which I feel like might maybe more important. Um, so please, if you all could could comment and just let me know what you think, it it means the world to me because you know that feedback just helps me improve. So. Um, Please comment uh, as well, you know, please like and subscribe. That means a lot as well. Um, but, you know, I, I want to say thank you so much for for just watching this because it means the world to me. Um, you know, I want to I wanna take you on this journey with Two Little Feet Podcast. You know, I'm, I'm very excited for it. So, once again, thank you so much.